I've got one question for you. Are you ready to get your game on? The longest running off road and action motorsports radio show on the planet is coming to you live with the biggest guest in motorsports. Here is the only man on the planet who can pack this much dirt slinging and tire slaying into two hours a week. Sit back, strap in, and be prepared to get your ears blown. Here is Jim Beaver and the Down and Dirty Radio Show, powered by Polaris Razor. Good morning and welcome to the Down and Dirty Radio Show powered by Polaris Razor with support from General Tire, KMC Wheels, Rigid Industries, Dirt Fish Rally School, Gibson Exhaust, and MTX Audio, the official audio partner of the Down and Dirty Radio Show. And I got to tell you, if you are listening in this Monday... You're in a recorded voice, myself and uh, and Amy Hood. We are in the house, and uh, we're going to kind of take you through a quick intro here and uh, kind of recap the first half of the year. But uh, it's been Canada Day in Canada. It's 4th of July in the United States, and Amy and I said, hey, what the heck, we're going to take a day off. So uh, what do you got going up there, Amy? Happy American Day! What's going on, my American friends? Um, I mean, obviously Canada Day would be before America Day because we are the better nation and land of the free, just saying, just saying. Um, but You're poking a hornet's nest here. I know, I'm totally going to be to hear something about this. It's funny because I actually, like, sent a video to all my American friends on Canada Day. I was like, Canada! Heck yeah! <laughs> and, uh, you know, just praising my great nation, and they're totally not about it. So I bet you're going to get a lot of hate videos today in spite of it. So, uh, But, yeah, no taking the day off. Um, you know, I had a, had a fun weekend of racing. Um, everything's good. Living the dream. What can I say? Yeah, for sure. Well, you know, we're halfway through the year. You know, it's, uh, you know, the first part of July. And, uh, you know, I are taking a, just a one-week one breather. But uh, I got to say, you know, uh, you know, we've we've been doing this now, I guess, you and I as a team for about six months. And we've had some pretty, uh, pretty fun shows. I know, uh, you know, in your segment, we've had some fun guests on air. I know we're going to re-air our, our segment with uh, Taylor Robert uh, right before he went on and took a medal at X Games. But uh, you were out at the Mint 400. I mean, we've we've had a lot of fun. Yeah, no, definitely. Taylor's one of my favorite interviews I've done so far. He, um, it, It's nice when you get people where you don't got to do a lot of talking and, you know, their personalities kind of speak for themselves and they can just go on go on their own tangents and tell us stories and stuff. So, um, yeah, I, I definitely w- would love to replace his segment because he's just an awesome guy. And I really want to have him back on as well. So um, let's, let's, uh, let's get rolling with him. Yeah, for sure. I know uh, he he sent me a text as soon as we were off air, and he's like, I want to come back on. I had so much fun, you know, and it's fun when you get a guest that's that amped up and, uh, you know, and especially one that goes out literally a couple days later and wins the next game's medal. Yeah, no, totally. (laughs) He's awesome. Yeah. You gotta hear how his wedding was coming along. If they got any, uh, you know, motocross-inspired stuff um, um, stuck in there like we were talking, he maybe was going to ride to the, the reception on the motorcycle. So I, I can't wait to see what they have to find out. Yeah, for sure. But I know on my side, uh, you know, some of my favorite interviews, obviously a guy that needs no introduction, Jason Ellis, uh, just a ton of fun being able to dial in with him and a guy that has his own show and, and is becoming a legend of radio. But uh, I, I had a lot of fun. Uh, had Tanner Faust on air, Tanner, a good friend of mine, and then uh, somebody you are uh, well aware of, Jolene Van Vute. And it's been probably a, over a year since I've had her on air, and she's a good friend of mine. And uh, that was always fun having her on. And uh, the girl's just absolutely killing it right now. Yeah, no, I'm really sad that she couldn't be my fill and rider for Paracross, but obviously she's got a lot of stuff going as well for her, so she was still over in, overseas, and uh, we had Cynthia fill in, and I mean, I couldn't have asked for a better, cooler chick, too, coming from Canada as well. So, uh, yeah, I mean, you always get cool people on your show. That's what I like about it. It's like a different variety. It's just not the same people. The people win and everything. You know, there's a lot of, like, um, you know, up and comers and um, women and stuff. So it's nice to have a variety. It keeps everything interesting and, and a lot of different sports too. So you know, you got a little bit for everybody. 
Yeah, you know, and I think that's what's fun. You literally never know who is uh, going to pop up on a Monday morning. And sometimes Sunday night, I don't even know who's going to pop up on a Monday morning. And then, bam, I'll get a text from somebody, and they want it on air, or they need to get on air. And it's like, oh, wow, you know, they, well, this is going to be fun, you know. And, um, you know, but if, talking about, you know, we, we've you know, kind of talked about the first half of the year, and, and obviously you and I had a ton of fun. I mean, you know, and, and you know, we had a ton of fun at the Mint uh, doing some radio there. And I know you ran for Miss Mint. Uh, you know, we had a good time hanging out with our friend Matt Piva and, and Ronnie Renner. Um, you know, I, I, I think some of the things that happen in Vegas need to stay in Vegas, but uh, yeah, right? Yeah, like the hangover. Gosh. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I was struggling all day when we were on air. I was just like, oh my gosh, it was so hot and I had no voice. So I feel like Renner yells out from the crowd that I sound like a drunken pirate because I had no voice and I just sounded terrible. <laughs> and yeah, that was really bad. Yeah, but, I, I mean, again, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas, and I, now I know just not to get, you know, not to have too much fun. The night before, you got to be on air because I'm when I get, hey, I'm loud when I'm sober. So think of when I have a couple bubblies and I'm having a good time with all my friends. I just want to yell at the top of my lungs and just shout woohoo. So I have no voice the next day. <laughs> well, and, and adding Ronnie Renner into the mix, I mean, he's no angel, man. <laughs> you have Ronnie Renner to, into any mix, and uh, and things can get out of hand in a hurry, I think. I mean, I think I showed him up pretty good. Like, I, I think I can hold my own. I think he had to do some keeping up with me. Just throwing it out there. Yeah, I, I think he's dodging a bullet because it uh, seems like every time we want to get him on air, uh, for some reason he's he's got something going. So I, I think he's almost scared to come on air with us at this point. No, I mean, that guy, it's crazy. He has so much going on. He represents a lot of brands. It looks like he, you know, gets to travel the world doing what he loves. And he's also a family man, you know. He has a bunch of kids at home and a wife. So um, he's busy. He's staffed. He's living the dream, definitely. I hope my life is as fun and crazy and, you know, fun-filled at that age uh, when I'm his age, so. Yeah, for sure. And I, I meant that, you know, totally joking to those of you that don't know, Ronnie Renner, uh, good friends of Amy's and, and mine, and uh, and he knows he's welcome on air anytime. And, you know, he, he's a teammate of mine with Polaris. And uh, the stuff he's got going, I mean, just uh, just the free riding, both on his KTM and on his Polaris, I mean, he's just killing it. it the videos he's dropping are just mind-blowing. Yeah, no, he's a, a great representation for brands. He does he does so much stuff, and he, you know it's it's crazy because we gotta keep in mind like he comes from a background of being a professional freestyle athlete, but he looks like one of those guys who's just like who, who his job is to be an athlete and travel the world and have fun, which makes you know people who want to buy a Polaris Razor or want to head out to the desert look like they can do it too because uh, you know he's not some pro going out there to race. He's going to have a good time. So uh, really good representation for you know brands out there. So uh, kudos to him. He does an awesome job at marketing himself and and the people that. Uh, is under his belt. Yeah, for sure. So uh, looking at the second half of this year, I mean, what's on tap for you? Obviously, I know you and I, uh, teammates in Terracross, we're not going to talk about San Diego. I talked about that enough. But uh, uh, I know you're going to kick off uh, with some Terracross racing in uh, Minnesota and Charlotte. But what else is on tap for you, Amy? Um, well, I still have a whole uh, second half of my motocross season coming up. Um, and then Terracross, like I'm trying to get dialed in for that. I know it's only two rounds, but it's four races. And I don't want to show up to get second place. Sarah Price, I'm calling you out there. You know, nice, friendly competition. Like, I want to go and hopefully win a couple. So, going to head down to Levi Valleys and train and test it out. I mean, when I say train, I mean go and jump stuff. I mean, not much training to go on there. But (laughs) to go and have some fun. And, um, and yeah, just kind of kill it on the regular. Um, I'm really trying to organize a U.S. motocross school tour where I can, you know, hit up some of the bigger cities like California, um, Colorado, Wisconsin, and then over over on the East Coast and teach a couple motocross schools and um, a couple fitness boot camps and stuff all in one good time. Just, uh, you know, spread the love. I want to go ride everywhere. I want to go travel and, um, you know, meet all the people and fans that uh, make the sport what it is. And, you know, that's what, I, that's what I like. Like, I like racing here in Manitoba, but... I've been racing the same track for so long. Like, I, I need a change. I want to switch it up. I want to go ride with new people and meet new friends. And, yeah, that's, that's my plan in the works right now. Little U.S. motocross school tour. So, yeah. anybody well, else that wants me to come where you're at? Come to Arizona. I got a six-year-old that needs to go to Amy's uh, motocross school. I'm telling you, girl, we need to get her dialed in with you. I have. I've actually been talking to the Abbots that 
um, if I come down there, uh, Destry and Cooper are going to help um, teach me, like help teach my class as well, and then we'll try to head over to the D training facility to do a, a workout class. So I've been hitting them, hitting them up, seeing if we can make it possible and stuff. But with the with these schools, I want you know everywhere I go, I want to kind of have like the local fast pro to come and help and teach us and teach as well, so they can, you know. It's just a well-rounded, full, fun weekend and get everybody involved in the community and stuff and, you know, give the local pros some support as well. And, and yeah, do it that way. So, so I'm trying. Yeah. Well, I got to tell you, when you get out to SoCal, especially if you get out to Abbott's, we'll uh, we'll have to schedule something. We'll throw down some radio there from Destries. He's a good friend of the show and uh, just good people out there. I think that would uh, be a ton of fun. And uh, he's been wanting to get me out there to check out his place, and uh, and it's just a long time coming. So I think that could be fun on on many on many fronts. Yep, totally. Yeah. Well, I think that'd be a blast. I know me. I've been pretty blessed this year and and last year to travel the country and. Uh, you know, and, and whether it be rally or off road or razors or uh, whatever, you know, it seems like I've always got a car that I can jump in and slide sideways and, uh, you know, a microphone in front of me and been pretty blessed with a lot of opportunities. And it seems like you're starting to get what's that? And that's the cool thing about racing like everywhere you go, you can find a dirt bike and a track to ride, whether you go in the trails or the bush or, you know, ride on the beach or something like anywhere you go there's someone with a bike who is willing to take you riding. And, you know, I've hit up a lot of people from, like, Costa Rica or Mexico or, you know, some really cool, like, rural areas of the world who are like, come here, I got a bike, let's go ride. So I'm like, uh, yeah, let's do it. So that's what I really want to do in life is obviously, you know, travel the world and find out all these cool places that motocross can take you and just, uh, you know, enjoy it and, uh, you know, I don't care if I'm making millions as long as you're, like, doing what you love to do. And so what else can I say on a, a day that we're celebrating the nation is to go out and live your dreams? <laughs> yeah, right. And uh, I think that's a good note to end this thing, on. So uh, right now we are uh, going to roll right into uh, some interviews with Tanner Faust, Jason Ellis, Jolene Van Butte, and Taylor Robert. Uh, thanks, Amy, and uh, we'll be back next Monday. Thanks, guys, and have a great 4th of July. I hope everybody stays safe. Have a beer and, yeah, raise uh, that American flag. Sing loud and proud. And go ride a dirt bike. Sounds Bye. good. Bye. All right. We are joined on the line by none other than Mr. Tanner Faust. How's everything going, Tanner? So far, so good. This uh, 2015 is probably going to be a pretty busy year, and uh, the fun's kind of already started. So, so yeah, it's going good. Well, you know, let's let's talk a little bit about uh, you know before we lead into these big announcements you had you know for 2015. Let's let's talk. Let's go back a year and, and talk about uh, you know 2014. Obviously, you know, big uh, big deal coming out of your camp it was uh, you know the Andretti announcement, the switch to Volkswagen, and uh, obviously we learned last year those cars are are lightning quick. Yeah, well, Andretti did some some magic with those polos. You know, those were kind of older spec polos from the Markman team in Europe. And um, they were basically handed these cars with some old tech and, and old thinking and, and not really knowing how much time was on the different parts. And, you know, these parts in these 600-horsepower uh, cars, some of them only last, you know, three events. So you need to know how many events the differentials and the transmission the engine have had. And Andretti went in there with nothing and really made those cars work. They um, weren't the most consistent, and, um, you know, I struggled – Sometimes Scott struggled sometimes, but um, ultimately uh, didn't, I didn't have the best championship points running after a, a, you know, a good first weekend in Barbados and one win in New York ultimately just wasn't in the fight. So I got to test the, the beetle, which is, was really, you know, in preparation for this year. Yeah, well, and, and talking about this year, I mean, you know, obviously everybody knew you were going to be back in, in uh, you know, in Global Rallycross this year. But, uh, you know, I know uh, you dabbled a little bit in Pro 2 last year. You come back, you make this announcement. Obviously, you're going to do some Pro 2s, uh, teaming up with, uh, you know, my friend Rob McCachern, which is a solid program. Uh, and then coming back to Formula Drift, I think that caught everyone by surprise. Well, there's, you know, working with Volkswagen, there's, uh, we want to be involved in um, – I'd like to be involved in more than, you know, just one platform of the brand. And there's, they've got a lot of great cars and there's a lot of great stories there. Uh, and it, it's not quite as plugged into some of the, you know, other action-y 
disciplines of, of motorsport out there, like drifting and off-road trucks. And so drifting was an opportunity to um, kind of expose VW to something they'd never really done before, um, just like GRC was an opportunity to expose VW to, you know, a 600-horsepower Beetle. And um, so it's been fun to dabble in those. I'm still focused on the GRC championship as, you know, the core, but um, jumping into those different disciplines, it's, it's, it's awesome, honestly, to go back into drifting and, and get into touch with those, you know, that cool fan base that drifting has. Um, so I'm really looking forward to that. But uh, we are drifting a 900-horsepower Passat, so it's definitely an out-of-the-box kind of a sport. Yeah, well, and, and talking about, you know, Formula Drift, uh, um, you know, th- that sport, you know, I, I know talking with Forsberg and Vaughn and, and Turk and some of those guys that have been around since the start, I mean, you know, you, you look through the record books and you're still wanting the, one of the winningest drivers in, in Formula Drift, uh, you know, but talk a little bit about how that sport's changed because, I mean, just literally in the past couple of years, I mean, much like, you know, GRC, it, they have uh, brought everything up a notch. I mean, it, it literally, uh, you know, the technology and, and everything that goes into those cars, I mean, it, it started where it was kind of a run what you brung, but I mean, they've got in engineering teams and everything else there at the track. And, and those cars are, uh, you know, every bit as, uh, you know, advanced as any other form of motorsport. Well, yeah, there's been a steady progression, I think. And, and from, you know, the very first year, the 350Z that we ran was, you know, nearly stock with an APR twin turbo kit. I mean, obviously it has power and handbrake and all the, the key essentials, but chassis wise is basically stock. Um, and things really, Progressed. What I always liked about the sport is the variety of cars. And when we went with the Scion, you know, we had the chance to put a NASCAR engine in there from TRD, and that was kind of cool. And, you know, you'll see just the most ridiculous cars lined up at the start of the Formula D event, which is cool. And then, um, but now there's such an emphasis on steering angle. There's the car in driving the Passat and testing it. It has so much steering angle. It's almost twice the angle that the car I drove back in 2010 had. And there's much more emphasis on angle through the course than, you know, speed. I don't even think speed is counted in the judging, which back in the day, um, it was really about commitment and entry speed and coming at the wall with high speed um, and uh, not so much on carrying a, a big angle around the course. So there's differences. Judges are looking for different things. Um, going tandem with uh, the cars, which now, by the way, have like twice as much horsepower as they used to. Um, yeah, it's going to be it's going to be a challenge. There's no doubt, but uh, still burning some tires and having fun. So I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, it's definitely uh, definitely got to be kind of cool going back to some of the old stomping grounds. You know, I guess, uh, you know, with Formula Drift and seeing a lot of the same faces still involved in the series. And uh, I think it's going to be awesome bringing Volkswagen, a new manufacturer to this sport. And, uh, you know, and, and good luck with that. I think it's uh, going to be a lot of fun come Long Beach. Yeah, that'll be cool. I mean, Long Beach is a tricky little track, just concrete walls. Of course, it uses uh, turn nine to, what is it, 11 of the, the Grand Prix course. Um, but it, it must be 10 years now during Long Beach that, you know, drifting's been involved there, and maybe 11 years. So it's been going on for a long time, and um, it's, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. I'm, I'm, I'm going to spend a lot of time. I'm not going to have a big pit presence. I'm not going to have a giant team. I mean, it's going to come in with, Kind of a small rig and a and a car and a small group of guys that I used to work with, and um, but spent a lot of time with the fans and getting reconnected with uh, with that group of fans that follows drifting around, which are a really cool group of people. Yeah, well, and it's it's had to have been kind of cool for you because you know obviously you've done stage rally, you've done Formula Drift, you've done you know GRC, um, you know, and, and many other things. You know, you, the Top Gear presence, and and now you know Lucas Oil. You know, and you've been able to kind of bring your fan base around, uh, you know, around you through through all these different venues. And it's got to be kind of exciting for you to see have them, you know, follow you to these new uh, endeavors of yours. It used to be. I mean, it's funny you mention. I guess it used to be really. Separated, you know. I'd go to a drift event, and uh, you know, because I did drifting and stage rally at the same time for eight years. And the drift events would be, uh, you know, one group, and I'd see some of your faces from the other drift events, and then the, the stage rally was another group. And um, and then sometimes at X Games they would come together, 
And it was all kind of interesting to see the different groups come together. But now there's, with Top Gear out there, there's a, a real common denominator, and it's whether it's Lucas um, off-road racing or uh, now the drifting this year, but, um, you know, rallycross, even if it's in Europe, uh, or X Games, there's the, the people that I talk to, the vast majority of them are Top Gear fans. And so it's kind of this one group that uh, I get to kind of hang out with and talk to um, about the show and about the motorsport and stuff like that. And, and it's a, it's really, Top Gear really has changed things in, in that respect. And this last Lucas weekend, last, last weekend we raced down at Elsinore. First of all, I think it was the biggest ticket sales I've ever had. I think it was like 12,000 people and they only seat 5,000. I don't know how that worked out. Yeah. But the, um, there are so many Top Gear fans there. It was awesome just to, to see that crowd coming into a, a new venue that maybe they've never been to before. Yeah. Well, and talk about that, you know, in, uh, you know, in Elsinore, I mean, you know, Pro 2, obviously, you know, you've got a lot of experience in rear-wheel drive with the drift, uh, you know, but, uh, you know, talk about that, because I know last year, you know, you had some hiccups, you, you're jumping into a solid program with Rob McCachron, I mean, one of the elite level teams in, in Lucas, but uh, seems like you really, uh, you know, you came into your own this this past round, I mean, I think, uh, you know, you had a top, you know, what, a 10th and a 7th, I mean, Pro 2, that's one of the toughest divisions in short course, you, you know, you kind of threw yourself to the wolves, but you're holding your own. I mean, how, how did things kind of come around at, uh, at Elsinore? Um, it's, you know, I've done a few weekends with this truck, and we've always had this engine problem. We couldn't get it to run after the jumps, and it was maybe a technique thing. We thought, um, I, you know, there, when you're in the air, which you're in the air a lot, of time, a lot of the time in the track, and when you're at that kind of zero-G flying point, you really have to keep the engine running with a little bit of help on the throttle. And um, I, I thought maybe um, my technique wasn't keeping it running, and I started struggled every time. But this this weekend, we found an issue with the fuel system, and now now the truck is running the whole way around the track, and it's awesome. And so I, I really felt like I could go ahead and focus on how to get time um, around the track. And I'm still off the back with the time; I'm still a second down at least. But uh, it's it's a it's a matter of the off roadiness now. It's a matter of working with the ruts um, and and taking a, a visual map of where the bumps are and where the ruts are every single you know the very first lap you get out there every single time. And those guys, McCachron and Brennan Zenner and Deegan and and uh, Bryce. I mean, those guys are so good at picking out the little ruts and pieces of grip. Um, their very first time around the track each session because the track changes all day. And so you have to take a, a, a little measurement of it the first time you see it. And then they click off identical laps, even with all the chaos of the ruts and the slippery spots on the track, um, like the machines. It's, it's awesome to see. Um, I just need some seat time. And, and uh, But this weekend is so fun um, to really get on the steeper side of the learning curve and, uh, and, and get it. Um, it it's, uh, it's also a matter of getting your system down. Because the, you know the trucks land so hard that if the seat is really made for Rob and seat belts and stuff, and I don't really have the, the right off-road head restraint system, and so and it's all it's putting all those things together. I think before it can really be, um, you know, consistently quick. And I certainly have a lot to learn before I can be quick. But man, it's a, the better it gets, the more fun it is. Yeah, and we're we're definitely going to see you uh, running a few rounds of Lucas this year. Obviously, we know not the full series, but uh, you're definitely going to try and, and hit up a few of the rounds, right? Yeah, I'm going to try to do at least two or three. I mean, I've only done the Elsinore track, and it has the hugest jumps. I mean, there's one jump that you're doing almost 200 feet every lap. <laughs> there's two other jumps where you're doing like 120 to 140 feet every lap. So you take some brutal landings. That's when you're by yourself. Then you get into the mix when, you know, and, and I... Uh, I got pretty comfortable throwing the tear offs off this time, which is good. It's a little, it's a little triumphs, Jim, where it's like uh, the, you know, everybody else is used to doing tear offs because they've been doing motocross you know, since they were like four. And for me, it's a little win if I get the tear off the first time I reach for it in the air. Um, so it's, it's baby steps. But um, man, when you're going door to door off these massive jumps and you have a little contact right before you leave the ramp and you're turning sideways in the air and you're grabbing a tear off and you're stuffing your Hans device back underneath the 
seatbelt. And I mean, there's so much going on inside the truck. It's just awesome. Well, and, and you got to think that, uh, you know, obviously, you know, your door to door in GRC has definitely helped with the competition factor in, uh, you know, in, in say, uh, you know, the Lucas series. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I like door to door racing and, and coming from a bit of a road racing background in the beginning of my career, I, I do miss it. I will say that the driving is a lot cleaner in uh, off road truck. I mean, excuse the pun, but in the off road truck racing, it is cleaner. Um, in GRC, it seems like if there's a car next to you, it's going to hit you at some point. You're going to feel it. Um, but uh, with the truck racing, they really try not to push into each other much. I think they get a black flag very quickly if they if they do, because it's so easy to turn somebody around on the dirt. Um, that, uh, that if it happens, you get penalized pretty quick. And I'd, I'd like to see that move into GRC. It would be nice if GRC had a little more stiff penalties for um, for messing up other people's races. Yeah. Well, and, and talking about, uh, you know, about GRC and, and looking at the 2015 season, I think, uh, you know, 2014 for the series as a whole was was kind of a turning point. I think, uh, you know, there for a while it was, uh, you know, over the first couple of years, it was kind of kind of figuring out, you know, where they wanted to be and, and what, you know, Rallycross in America was. And I think, you know, they kind of kind of got it dialed in last year and uh, it's got to kind of have you excited for 2015 because it seems like, you know, 2014, it, it, the series as a whole kind of went out on a high note. Yeah, it was, uh, well, for us, it was, you know, getting the, the Beetle out there and shaking the Beetle down. Um, I mean, BW built a great car, uh, and in Rallycross, as I've said before, is one of these sports that you just can't test in a in a vacuum. You, re- you really need, in order to get a, a real test of the car's abilities, you need to put it in battle and see how it responds to getting pushed by somebody else or see, you know, how tough it is there or the jumps. You know, there's lots of variables that need to be tested on track. And so we utilized 2014 well, I think, in in having that battle testing. Um, The car has been completely redeveloped over the winter, um, and so we'll have uh, very updated versions of the Beetle that will be more battle-ready in 15. So I think it was, like I said, incredibly productive of the way that 2014 went down. Um, On the series side of things, to your point, yeah, I think it's growing up quickly. From a marketing standpoint, from a growth standpoint, it's certainly checking the boxes. Um, and I think it's uh, moving more and more towards where we want it to be in a competitive standpoint also with the rules and regulations and scrutiny between the cars and, um, you know, an on-track penalties and, and getting an identify really where the balance is between demolition derby and racing and, uh, and finding there. So I think it's honing in on it. I'm looking forward to this year. Well, and, and I know, you know, you as a competitor, I mean, you're one of those guys, you, you always like a high competition level, you know, and, and uh, you know, I think, you know, there the first couple of years, if you weren't in, uh, you know, an Oldsburg Ford, you really didn't have a chance. And I think as we saw last year and then coming into this year and now with Ganassi making their announcement, um, you know, it, it went from maybe three or four drivers that could win to, to possibly eight, you know, eight different drivers on track that, that has a shot at a win. And you as a driver, I mean, it's it's got to be pretty cool to, to see that competition level and that bar raise. And, and, you know, a lot of that was in part to, to you and, and Scott and, and the Andretti announcement going back to the beginning of last year. Yeah, we've been pushing. We've had driver alliances where we've, you know, gotten together and tried to raise the competition level. We've been A lot of people have been pushing for a long time to tighten up the racing. It's a gray area. It's a difficult uh, thing to do, and I, and I feel for the organizers in that because it's the only FIA sport uh, where there's no penalty for contact. And, um, you know, between cars. And that, that's, um, and so there is a gray area there. And then you take into the U.S., where most of our races in the U.S. are on tarmac, um, where contact between cars, uh, rather than just kind of pushing the car uh, and sliding cars uh, out of the way, the force goes actually into the car because there's more grip on the road. And so, so contact basically causes more damage uh, on pavement than it does on gravel. And so we get, um, you know, a lot of damage between cars. It's fundamentally, I think the racing's getting better and better, and the drivers are all getting better and better, and the cars are getting better. Certainly, the teams are, and so I think the organizers are matching that. 
Yeah. Any uh, any specific event this year you're looking forward to? Obviously, you know, you've been kind of one of the staples in the series, uh, you know, going back to uh, to almost the start. You know, any uh, any particular tracks that, that kind of cater to your driving? I mean, you, you're pretty excited with the mix. You like to see a little more dirt. I mean, uh, you know, kind of, kind of talk about the diversity of the tracks you guys are running and, uh, and what caters to Tanner Faust. Well, I think the Seattle race is a, is a great one, you know, for my style anyway. It's very easy to adapt to dirt. Um, for me, the Barbados track is awesome because of location and because it's an actual racetrack. Um, and uh, there's some good speed there. Uh, but, you know, there are things, there's things about all of them I like. And um, so, so I'm just down. For me, it's a, the, the biggest change. Um, you know, I'll be doing some of the world rounds also, which are on bias by tires. And the biggest change for me in the U.S. Is, is working with the radial tires where the car has to be much more straight and really cannot slide at all. And so that's what I tend to do um, during the weekend is, is uh, really focusing on getting the most out of the radial tire. It doesn't sound like much, you know, a difference between this tire and that tire construction, but it's night and day in how the cars um, have to be driven. So uh, I really enjoy that challenge of coming to one race and, you know, being completely focused on exactly how that car has to be driven and then go to a drift event and be focused on how that car has to be driven and, and so on and so forth. So that's, but um, uh, I, I'm looking forward to getting back into Beetle. It's an incredible little machine, and uh, getting you know getting back into the radio tire tire world and, and uh, getting some speed out of that car. Yeah. Well, and, and talking, you know, you mentioned there that you're, you're going to go and run, uh, you know, the world championship uh, a few rounds there. I mean, how, how has the reception been? I mean, you know, as an American going over and, and running the European rounds, obviously, you know, you've done it. There, there's been a couple other drivers that have done it, but you were, you know, pretty much the first that went over there and said, hey, I, I want to compete with the Europeans. I mean, how, how's that reception been? Um, it was, uh, you know, I first went over there, it was a time ago, I think it was 2010. And um, it was the sport was in a different place, you know. But in the U.S., I never really talked about rallycross. Um, and if they did, they visualized like 800 horsepower Volvos, you know, sliding around in the dirt. And uh, but it, it was a different place. It was most private teams. There were only a couple um, professional teams there. Nobody really had ever put a GoPro on their car and collected some content. And, um, but it was such a visually stimulating kind of amazing sport that, um, I couldn't, I couldn't help but gather a bunch of, uh, video on GoPros and stuff. And so I think they more thought that was weird that I was, uh, had GoPros on the car than in, in American. Um, and then when I started winning rounds, then it, then it was, um, and it was a good thing. I was really proud. On 4th of July, I won around and, uh, in Sweden, which was at the time was the biggest round in the series, and you know, I I really felt a little bit of national pride there. Um, uh, you know, being the only American to run in the series, uh, it was the year before last that that Deegan came over and did one round in Finland, and um, I ended up winning that one. Uh, so it was, you know, Americans had that we had a good showing between the two of us, and then uh, Ken has done a couple rounds last year, so. So now, yeah, like you said, they've seen a few American flags there. The tracks, and the funny thing is, you know, they have a line of flags representing, you know, all the drivers that are there. The tracks have to scramble and go find an American flag somewhere to put up there whenever one of us comes over there because, you know, it's been 47 years of not having any Americans compete over there ever. So it's, uh, it's, kind of, it's really kind of a fun thing, actually. Yeah, it sounds uh, sounds really cool, and and we got to talk a minute before I let you go. You know what? You know one of your big things it kind of ties everything together, like you were saying with your fan base, Top Gear. I mean, uh, obviously, you know, you're back with Top Gear for uh, for another season. I, I got to tell you, you guys have a lot of fun on that show. We do, we do, and that you know that's been sort of a mantra lately. It's just keeping driving fun, and that's um, you know automated cars are, are they have a place, but it scares me that. Uh, you know, we're going to not have this fun of driving that a lot of us have made a living out of, you know, the fact that driving is fun. And Top Gear is just one of those shows that, you know, that it's it's about the fun of driving. It happens to be three jackasses that are, you know, beating up on each other the whole time, I guess. But, but what we're doing is just fun stuff. And, um, yeah, I, I 
I really, uh, I, I also like being able to bring like rally cross or drifting or other things that, that are fun about driving and bring them into the show, integrate them into the show, which we've gotten to do a lot of in the last couple of years. But I'm looking forward to getting back on set with those guys um, and, uh, and beating on some, beating on some cars. It, it, the stuff we have lined up this year is really cool, actually. Yeah, well, and I got, I got to ask you, I got to put you on the spot because it's been a year. And uh, last year, about this time, we kind of did a GRC preview and, uh, you know, talked about the Andretti announcement. And I asked, what what has been the most fun car you've driven, uh, whether it be Top Gear or, or Sun Driving or anything else? And, and last year at this time, it was a Bugatti. Has that changed? Um, well, on Top Gear, the most fun car that I've uh, driven was um, a Ferrari F12. Yeah. Um, that was insane. Um, uh, uh, PCH, we had the road closed down, drifting and all sorts of stuff. Um, but I will tell you yesterday, uh, for the first time I went out to Willow Springs and I tested, uh, my new 900 horsepower Passat and it makes so much grip and has so much power. And it has this insane header system where the headers actually, because of the rules, you can't move the engine back into the firewall. Mm -hmm. So there's not enough room for the exhaust through the tunnel there. So the actual headers come forward into this, like, snake spiral near the front bumper. And um, Papadakis, who built it, uh, did an amazing job on the uh, exhaust. And it just screams this in the sound and the drifting and the, the power and everything. I mean, so yesterday was that Passat was the most fun. I, I can officially say the most fun I've had in a car this year was in a Passat. Uh, and I got to say, I'm looking forward to the Passat just because it, it's so out of the box. I mean, you know, like you said, you, 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 you're not expecting a 900 horsepower Passat. But uh, I got to tell you, you know, you, you know, high horsepower Mustangs, Camaros, you're kind of used to seeing that. Passat, uh, you know, it's uh, it's definitely going to catch some people's attention. Yes, it could be the only one that uh, that you see this year. <laughs> That's right. You'll see a lot of thousand horsepower muscle cars, but probably not many, you know, 900 horsepower Passats, yes. <laughs> well, I appreciate you taking the time for an interview. I know you're awful busy running multiple series, uh, you know, with Top Gear and everything else, uh, but uh, as always, you're always welcome on the show, and I appreciate it, Tanner. Great to catch up, Jim. All Good right. to talk to you. Thank you. Yeah, we'll see you in a couple of weeks. Okay. Thanks, buddy. <laughs> I'm Polaris rider Lee Valley Valley, and I choose Polaris just because they have the best quality, highest performing, most fun machines out there. Only one company has taken Levi Valley to 10 X Games medals, snowcross championships, a double backflip, and a world record long jump of 412 feet across the San Diego Harbor on New Year's Eve, and that company is Polaris. Whether it's dominating the X Games, racing a stock Polaris Razor XP1000 in the Terracross Championship, or just hitting the trail on the weekend, for over 20 years, Levi has relied on the same quality Polaris vehicles and products you can purchase at your local Polaris dealer. Take the advice of action sports legend Levi Lavalley and visit Polaris on the web at Polaris.com to see the full lineup of Polaris vehicles or follow them on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Polaris Razor. For 100 years, General Tire has provided tires for your lifestyle, your adventure, your anywhere. Born from competition, the Grabber Tire offers the durability and off-road traction you demand in a tire. We put these tires to the test in the harshest off-road racing conditions to give you a tire that will make your anywhere possible. So let us take you on your next big adventure. Tweet us photos at General Tire, hashtag anywhere is possible. Because with General Tire, anywhere is possible. Baja, check. King of the Hammers, check. Crandon, check. The Mint 400, check. Only one wheel company can say they have dominated the deserts and rocks of the Southwest to the mud and carnage of the big house at Crandon, and that company is KMC Wheels. KMC Wheels has won them all with the help of elite drivers like Travis Pastrana, Ricky Johnson, Bryce Menzies, Carl Renazetter, and Lauren Healy, who all rely on the XD Series from KMC Wheels to get them to the finish line and on top of the podium. Check out KMC Wheels and their full line of XD Series wheels 
at kmcwheels.com or on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at KMC Wheels. KMC Wheels, like no other. Are you looking for a place to push yourself behind the wheel and see how your driving skills stack up? Dirtfish Rally School is that place. Located on 315 acres of pristine automotive playground at the foot of the Cascade Mountains in Snoqualmie, Washington, right outside of Seattle. Dirtfish Rally School is a -a one-of-a-kind place where everyone from first-time drivers to seasoned professionals like Bucky Lassick and Antoine Lestage can push themselves to their limit. Whether driving the high-performance rally-prepped all-wheel drive Subaru Impreza STI is what you're looking for, or you'd rather hang it all out in the rear-wheel drive Subaru BR Z's, Dirtfish Rally School has something for everyone. Classes are available from two hours to three full days and feature instructors with over 150 years of combined racing experience. Whether you're looking to become the best and get an edge on the competition or just looking to freshen your skills behind the wheel, Dirtfish Rally School is the place to go. For more information on registering for classes, visit Dirtfish on the web at dirtfish.com or to check out the latest happenings from Dirtfish, follow them on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Dirtfish Rally. Rigid Industries is the original and number one LED light bar manufacturer in the world. Torture tested by some of the best drivers in motorsports. Rigid LED lighting products use cutting edge technology and can stand up to the harshest conditions Mother Nature can dish out. Designed, engineered, and assembled in the United States, Rigid LED lighting is the only choice for your off-road vehicle or boat. Find out more information on the entire line of Rigid Industries LED lighting products at www.rigidindustries.com. Life is all about sound, the sound of sports, the sound of the racetrack, and the sound of your vehicle. Don't drive around listening to this. Drive around listening to the sound of performance. Gibson Performance. Gibson Performance Exhaust is the company who can turn this into this. Remember that life is all about sound, and Gibson Exhaust is the sound of performance. Check out your next catback exhaust system, headers, muffler, or UTV exhaust at GibsonPerformance.com and get more power and more sound. All right, we're catching up with my next guest, uh, one of my favorite people to have on air, a good friend of mine, Miss uh, Jolene Van Vute. How's everything going, Jolene? Everything's awesome. I'm so stoked to be back on the show. I know it's uh, there for a while. We're banging them out, having you uh, having you on every few months, and then uh, now I was trying to look back, and I'm like, my go- goodness, like I don't know. Last time we actually talked, I'm like, was it like the Nitro show in Phoenix, like a year and a half ago? I don't know. It's been a while though. <laughs> It might have been. Uh, we've been pretty pinned uh, since since you and I last spoke. We, you know, filmed Action Figures the movie all last year into the fall after we were done touring. And since the new year, we've been pinned again, just touring nonstop. New Zealand, Japan, Australia. We just got home this week, and we start off again into the U.S. So it's kind of crazy. Yeah, you know, it, it's got to be exciting, though. You get to see these these amazing places. I mean, now kicking off the U.S. tour, which was sellouts. Uh, I think you got, like, six dates in Canada this year. That's got to be pretty exciting for you. Yeah, I'm pretty stoked about that. Uh, the Canadian dates don't happen until the second part of the North America tour, which will be in the fall. But I'm definitely really excited to do a show in Toronto and a couple other areas in Canada where I know friends and family will finally be able to, to catch what I uh, what I do. Yeah, for sure. So, you know, talking about, uh, you know, talking about the tour, I mean, obviously uh, you on a personal level, you've been down there, you know, New Zealand, Australia, Japan, but, uh, but you, uh, you know, we're, we're going to get to to the big nitro news here, you know, that happened this week, just uh, in a little bit, but uh, you on a personal level, I mean, uh, BMX double back BMX front. I mean, you've been killing it, pushing yourself. Yeah, you know, it's been really cool uh, with the Nitro Circus Live shows and being able to do this sort of transitional thing over with the BMX. It's not something I grew up doing or ever really thought I I would actually be in a place to do, you know, growing up riding dirt bikes and only really ever wanting to try to make a living the best I could on a motorcycle. I never really foresaw, uh, you know, the pedal bike, but being on the tour and being around the guys, uh, you know, some of the most talented guys on a BMX I'm riding with all the time. And they've just been helping me and inspiring me and giving me advice and and helping me train for certain things. And 
every time I, you know, land a new trick, I'm like, okay, which, which one of these next ones do, do I think I can get, you know? So started with, a, you know, just a single backflip and I was like, all right, I think I can pull off a front flip on this thing. And, you know, on the tour last year in uh, Australia was throwing that down. And then I was like, you know what, I'm, I'm pretty sure I can do a double. I want to do a double, you know, no girls done a double backflip on a B of X. And I mean, I've been flipping things for years. I'm pretty sure with just just giving it the commitment to go around twice, I can make this happen. And I worked my butt off in uh, September and definitely crushed that one, uh, landing it uh, at October 2nd. I remember the date because I was so stoked uh, getting that footage for the action figures film. Yeah, well, you know, and talking about, you know, the BMX, I mean, obviously, uh, you know, there's some transition between that and, and the dirt bike. I mean, do you feel like uh, for you it's almost easier to learn stuff on a BMX and then transfer it to the dirt bike, or uh, is it something completely different? No, it, it's definitely, you know, two different two different things for sure. With with the dirt bike, you know, a lot of it is you have, you have the throttle, you have a lot of that control. Uh, on the BMX, you got to use a lot of your legs and pump transitions to get the type of power that you need to really pop off the ramp and, and get the height and the distance to be doing these tricks. So that's been a huge learning curve for me. I've really had to pick the guy's brains and, and have them critique me so that I'm able to kind of uh, teach my, you know, get myself to really learn how to do those transitions properly and pop off the ramp. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, it's been pretty cool to see, you know, you, kind of your transition into that and, and you know, and, and the way you've been able to progress that, you know, that sport, especially for women. I mean, there's some amazing women BMX riders, but, uh, you know, a lot of them are, you know, based on street and stuff like that. And you've definitely taken things to the air. It's been pretty cool to watch. Yeah, that's the thing. You know, like, I, I definitely do not have skills when it comes to, like, the, the street stuff and the, the smaller technical type of things that, I haven't been able to really wrap myself around that. I've been I've been trying to get a little bit better in, in parks and, and stuff. But when it comes to the big air, I think that's just a little bit more natural for me. And uh, I have, you know, I find it scar scarier to look at like a spine or a box jump and, and think about, you know, jumping it or flipping it. You send me down the gigantic ramp. I'm sort of willing to kind of huck anything. I just have... I don't know what it is about just the grandeur of the ramp gives me a little bit more comfort level. Yeah. Well, you know, you'll huck anything. Which is, uh, which is usually the opposite. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, and I know because I've been there on the floor and, uh, you know, hearing you say that, I'm like, you know, I grew up riding, you know, freestyle contests on my bike and jumping box jumps and dirt jumps and stuff like that. And, uh, you know, and, and when you took me down to the floor at the Nitro show and seeing those ramps, I mean, those are no joke. I mean, that's a legit, I mean, you know, that's ballsy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's it's a big setup, so. Yeah, for sure. So, uh, you know, let's talk a little bit about uh, the big news uh, coming out this week. Uh, obviously, Josh Sheehan, Sheeney, uh, you know, the, the triple back. I mean, that's that's huge, not only for, for action sports, but, uh, but for Nitro Circus. Yeah, this, I mean, I still, you know, four days later after the event has happened, it's still crazy to think that it's happened. You know, it, it was such a, amazing, and the way he made it look almost so flawless and effortless is just unbelievably epic. Um, history, you know, happening in Travis's backyard once again. Uh, the amount of stuff that's happened at Travis's house for action sports is just, you know, you unfathomable it's just so gnarly and the fact that i've been able to see the process of this double throughout the years you know this is something that travis put into play um many years ago and even before she was uh sort of in in the picture with the whole scenario uh travis brought him in uh hoping you know he wanted to see if he could bring on some other talented riders to get some input and and see what they thought about ramps and setups and and going to the bag jump, you know, that was a, a huge thing uh, moving forward with, with this trick also was getting the bag jump uh, to be a part of it and really being able to huck it off the massive ramps that throw you. I mean, at the peak of Cheney's triple, I think he was about 100 feet in the air. So, I mean, that's some intense time. And, and if you're not fully committed to that 110%, that's going to be some gnarly repercussions. So, it's been a pretty awesome experience watching Travis 
and Josh over the past two years, going back and forth with ramp setup and uh, going into the bag and, and trying to work through the process of this, and and then seeing Sheeny really come into his own on it, and Travis kind of bowing down, almost saying, you know, this this is something I really wanted, and and something that I thought I could do, and I wasn't quite able to get it, but. Josh, you have this, so run with it, and I will support you 110%. And, again, just showing how amazing Travis is as a friend and as a human and, and as he likes to see action sport uh, progress. And uh, he's, you know, embraced pushing Sheeny uh, to, to achieve this, and it was the most spectacular thing I have ever seen, and it's still crazy to think that it's happened. Well, you know, and, and me just, uh, you know, being able to watch the video and the social media that, that you and, and Josh and everybody at Nitro has put out, I mean, that ramp, I mean, absolutely, uh, absolutely insane. I mean, the height of that ramp, you, you know, and you know, here it was about 50 miles an hour you had to hit it at, but I mean, that that is uh, just a, a mammoth structure. Yeah, it's the gnarliest, largest, you know, <laughs> freestyle ramp uh, I've ever seen. It's I would not even consider going anywhere near it. You know, like when we, when Travis was still at first working with it, a lot of different people were like, "Oh, maybe maybe I'll hit it." What? Why are you? Why won't you hit it? Well, and I looked at that thing. I was like, "Are you crazy? My legs will buckle." Like you got to hit it so fast and it's so steep. I was like, "There's no way I am touching that ramp. I'm not going anywhere near it." Thank you very much. I will leave that to, you know two of the most talented guys on dirt bikes and they, they can have that. And, and I mean, Josh has done an amazing job with showing the world that something so crazy as a triple backflip, which we thought was impossible is completely possible. Yeah. Well, and, and, you know, talking about the ramp, I know I've, I've heard it was a little bit of, uh, of almost like uh, Rochambeau or, or drawing straws to see who hit it first, right? Out of, out of Travis and Josh. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that was a that was a funny process to see. Every time the the ramp got tweaked, or there was you know block it up, or push it down, or build this up, or build that up, uh, it was always you know Travis and, and Josh back there looking at each other. Were well, you gonna hit it first? Well, what do you think? Okay, okay, I'll hit it first. <laughs> you know, it was it was pretty uh pretty entertaining, and then pretty cool to see just sort of those two really you know, work through the process and uh, one would hit it and, and have his input on it and then the next would hit it and then they would come down and talk about it. You know, there was even, oh, well, let me hit it one more time so I can see what you're talking about sort of thing. They hit it and then reconvene and there would be some more ramp changes. I mean, I, I don't even, I think we lost track of the count on how many different uh, ramp changes until they got the ramp that was able to, to get the rotation. Yeah. Well, it, it's funny talking about Pastrana land, and, and I had this conversation a few months back with, with Greg Godfrey, and there's almost something, you, you look at the past 10 years and, and the stuff that's gone down, um, you, know, with, you know, with you and Travis and, and just about everybody at Nitro and, and obviously Sheeny now, but uh, uh, a place, you know, we were talking about, it's almost like it's a little bit of mystical, you know, it, it's a little bit mystical. Like, I mean, people go there and, you know, and, and literally it's, it's game changers that come out. I yeah we it's definitely you know I think you you hit the nail on the head there it it is a it's a very special place um, I over the past ten years have done I mean this has been my building ground for everything epic that I've been able to accomplish I I stand back there I was actually saying to someone the other day when I stand up on the top of the mountain I just kind of look around at the whole facility and and what's become. The, there's so much stories in all that dirt back there, you know, so many world firsts, so many crashes, so much um, time, effort, emotion, and hard work. And it's it's all in this one facility. Even myself, I mean, you know, my dirt bike backflip, I did my Supercross X Games training, my Enduro Cross X Games training. Um, I've trained for outdoor here, you know, foam pit training, BMX double back flip, BMX flip, BMX front flip. I mean, these were this all that stuff for me happened here. This is where it all began, and uh, it it really is one of those places that when you come and you're surrounded by all these people that have a, a will and a drive, the same as you, the same passion to to want to push themselves and push the envelope for action sports. 
you really do get magic made and uh it's an amazing platform and i whenever new athletes come you can see you can see that they see it you know you can see when they are are riding and interacting that they're they're feeling this place is pretty pretty rad yeah for sure um, yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, you, you know, from what I understand, it's, it's like you said, I mean, people go there and, and, you know, some of them don't even expect to be doing anything. And by the time you leave, you're, you're backflipping something, you know, it's like, yeah, <laughs> yes, that has happened a lot. <laughs> Um, and you always get the, Oh, I, I just came to watch. And it's like, Ooh, well, I, I understand. But when you come to Travis's, you have to always think there's a possibility that I'm not just here to watch. Yeah. <laughs> yeah you don't go to Pastrana land to watch, right? No, <laughs> no, you better, you better be hiding in the trees. <laughs> if, you're, if you're doing that. Oh, too funny. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, bring us a lowdown uh, real quick. Uh, obviously, action figures, uh, I know it's coming out at some point this year, correct? I, I, most of the filming's wrapped up. I mean, what's what's the timeline for action figures? Yeah, we are so very stoked about this film. Um, action figures, you know, jam-packed full of everything that we've wanted to do over the past few years. Uh, getting back to the gra- grassroots of Nitro Circus. Um, there's lots of different segments that sort of tap into all different types of sport and we worked really hard on it, uh, for, you know, most of last year, all the filming's done right now. It's in, it's just in post. Uh, I, I think there is actually a possible release date, but I don't know what the date is as of yet. So I don't want to throw it out there, but I know we're hoping for summertime release. Uh, and I'm just stoked for the. There's probably one of the raddest women's action sports sections ever in this film, and I am so, Tara and I worked really hard to to make that happen, and uh, and get a really good section for the girls, and we're really really stoked for people to see it because it's pretty rad. Awesome. Well, knowing that she's a part of it and you're a part of it, and, and I'm assuming uh, Lindsay's a part of it, uh, it's, it's definitely got to yep. be uh, got to be awesome. Yeah, yeah, we uh there's uh me, Tara, Lindsay, and uh, Emma McFerrin. Oh. Uh rad freestyler from uh from Australia and uh we definitely wanted to make sure that we we had a good group of girls that really showed um awesomeness and diversity. So we have that and it's it's an all across the board action sports uh women's section. So it's pretty cool. Yeah. Well, and I got to ask you this is totally off topic, but that's how the show is. So, uh we can go <laughs> with it, right? Um, but, uh, you know, talking about women in, in action sports and, and, uh, and racing and stuff like that, I got to ask you real quick. I mean, Vicki Golding getting her supercross license, uh, you know, obviously she's had some struggles, but she'll get up to speed. But I mean, you know, how do you feel about that? That's got to be exciting for you to see, uh, you know, Vicki pushing limits and, and, you know, and breaking barriers. Yes, definitely. Um, that, that whole, that whole scene makes me smile so much. I am such a huge supporter of her. Um, big fan, you know, she's a rad girl with massive talent. She's so sick on a bike and, um, I just love watching her ride and, uh, you know, her going to X and, and competing in, in whip and then, you know, her arena cross, um, career that she's had and now moving in and, and doing this at Supercross. And I think even, I think it was last night, she even tried step up for the first time to try the qualifiers for X. So, I mean, this girl's epic. She's, She's rad on a motorcycle, and I got much love for her and much support. All right. Yeah, she's, uh, you know, it's definitely, you know, something that I've been watching her, you know, her story, and I think it's it's really cool, you know, for, you know, somebody like that, and, and obviously you and, you know, how you're pushing barriers and, and, you know, redefining, you know, I don't want to say gender lines, but I, I think it's really cool saying, hey, look, you know, we're women and, and we can do this, you know? Yeah, you know, I, I don't think any of us, you know, set out with a purpose, uh, you know, to, you know, girl power type of scenario uh, um, in any case, but we're just doing what we love and, and showing the world that it, it doesn't really matter who you are uh, or what you love, but if you really are passionate about something and you want that to be what you do, if you work hard enough, you know, it is out there and it is attainable. Yeah. Um, so Nitro Tour uh, kicking off this week. Um, you know, give us uh, give us a lowdown. You know, why should people come out? Because I know why people should come out for it, but I want to hear from you. I mean, this is uh, this is absolutely uh, one of the best shows I've ever seen. Uh, you know, give, uh, give us a quick rundown. Well, I mean, not to be biased or anything, yeah. but it is pretty rad. <laughs> 
we are, you know, the largest action sports show in the world. Uh, we've been touring for five years now. We have 45 of the best athletes from all over the world that are in the disciplines of freestyle motocross, BMX, mountain bike, skateboarding, um, rollerblading, scootering. Uh, and then we obviously have the awesome Nitro Circus contraptions, which are, you know, boogie boards and bathtubs. And I jump a Barbie car. So, you know, it just kind of rounds it out really awesome. Two and a half hours of nonstop action. And it's just a fun thing that anybody uh, can come to. Men, women, children, uh, bring grandma and grandpa. We know they love this stuff, too, because we've had lots of them come to the show and, and leave happy. So if you uh, don't have anything to do one night and you want to just kind of thrill yourself, definitely check out Night Circus. And we know that we have a huge support system here in the U.S. Uh, where, where Nitro started. This is the root of, of it all. So uh, we're stoked to perform for our fans for sure. Yeah, well, I can tell you, you've got one six-year-old that absolutely squealed when she found out you're coming back to Phoenix, and that's my daughter. It's been literally an ongoing thing. <laughs> like once a month, she asked me, Dad, when do we go get to see Jolene again? Dad, when do we get to go see Jolene again? Aww. So it's literally like, it was like a squeal when we found out they were going back, when you guys were coming back to Phoenix. And it just so happens that your Phoenix date is the day before her birthday. So it's like, oh, my gosh, it just worked out perfect. That's awesome. Yeah, so... Uh, uh, for sure, but I appreciate you taking the time to uh, to come on air, and uh, I know you guys are busy getting ready to kick off the tour, and uh, you know, and and you know, obviously with Sheeny's uh, triple back, I mean that's been the buzz all over, uh, you know, pretty much all over, you know, mainstream media even. It's uh, just pretty wild. Yeah, yeah, we're still buzzing on it. Uh, you know, even Josh this morning again too. You know, he was saying, yeah, I I, like, I catch myself waking up in the middle of the night and, and kind of thinking for a second before I remember what's really going on, like, oh, about the triple. And then he goes, oh, wait a minute. No, I already did that. That's done. <laughs> you know, so it's it's really awesome that the, that we're all just able to now enjoy and, and really be be, uh, be pumped for him. Yeah, well, and he's, like, he's, you know, he's told me it, it's almost like it's a, a big weight lifted off his shoulders. And, and I'm sure all of you feel that way because, you know, you don't want to think about the bad things that could happen. But, you know, there, there had to have been some tension there, you know, as the build up to it. And, I mean, to stomp it on the first go, I mean, that's huge. Yeah, most definitely. Uh, you know, there are. Um, it's a high risk. What what we do uh, there, the uh, the scenarios can uh, can be pretty pretty bad sometimes, and you don't want to always think about uh, think about that. Um, but unfortunately, that's part of our industry, and uh, we're just really really glad that everything went well, and Sheeny is happy and healthy and able to celebrate this uh, this historic moment. Awesome. Well, I appreciate your time, Jolene. Uh, take care, and we'll definitely catch up soon. Great. Thank you so much for having me. All right. Thanks. Hey, I'm RJ Anderson, factory Polaris driver, and I drive Polaris because it's the most capable, race-ready off-road vehicle on the market. When RJ Anderson wanted to set a world record for the longest UTV jump in history, not once but twice, what company did he trust? Polaris and their championship-winning Razor XP1000. RJ is a UTV champion behind the wheel of Polaris vehicles, and he exclusively trusts the Polaris Razors to bring him race wins and championships against some of the toughest off-road racers in the world. The same Polaris Razors RJ has won championships in, set world records in, and conquered the wall of death in XP1K2 are available to you at your local Polaris dealer. Take the advice of world record holder RJ Anderson and visit Polaris on the web at Polaris.com to see the full lineup of Polaris Razor vehicles or follow them on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Polaris Razor. Your life demands a tire that provides durability, comfort, and performance, and that's what General Tire delivers for you. From the all-season grip of the Grabber UHP to the comfort and on-road manners of the Grabber HTS to the durability and off-road traction of the Grabber AT2, General has a tire that will help get you where you need to go. So let us take you on your next big adventure. Tweet us at General Tire, hashtag anywhere is possible, because with General Tire, anywhere is possible. 
Baja, check. King of the Hammers, check. Crandon, check. The Mint 400, check. Only one wheel company can say they have dominated the deserts and rocks of the Southwest to the mud and carnage of the big house at Crandon, and that company is KMC Wheels. KMC Wheels has won them all with the help of elite drivers like Travis Pastrana, Ricky Johnson, Bryce Menzies, Carl Renazetter, and Lauren Healy, who all rely on the XT Series from KMC Wheels to get them to the finish line and on top of the podium. Check out KMC Wheels and their full line of XT Series wheels at kmcwheels.com or on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at KMC Wheels. KMC Wheels, like no other. Looking to have some fun on four wheels? Dirtfish Rally School has you covered. Packing as much adrenaline and adventure as you can handle into high-performance all-wheel drive and rear-wheel drive Subaru rally cars is where the fun begins at Dirtfish. Just 30 minutes outside of Seattle and Snoqualmie, you'll get a chance to train up to three full days with some of the country's best instructors and be put through the high-octane rush of rally on mud, dirt, and tarmac. Get started today and call 425-888-7715 or visit us online at dirtfish.com and use code 911 for a 15% discount. Rigid Industries is the original and number one LED light bar manufacturer in the world. Torture tested by some of the best drivers in motorsports. Rigid LED lighting products use cutting edge technology and can stand up to the harshest conditions Mother Nature can dish out. Designed, engineered, and assembled in the United States. Rigid LED lighting is the only choice for your off-road vehicle or boat. Find out more information on the entire line of Rigid Industries LED lighting products at www.rigidindustries.com. Life is all about sound. The sound of sports. The sound of the racetrack. And the sound of your vehicle. Don't drive around listening to this. Drive around listening to the sound of performance. Gibson Performance. Gibson Performance Exhaust is the company who can turn this into this. Remember that life is all about sound, and Gibson Exhaust is the sound of performance. Check out your next catback exhaust system, headers, muffler, or UTV exhaust at GibsonPerformance.com. And get more power and more sound. Come to the island and rip it up this summer. Wakeboard Island. It's a skate park on water at Blue Water Resort and Casino. Check out the two-tower cable system that pulls you and your board over the water. No boats to watch out for. No fumes. Wakeboard Island is open to all skill levels with an open center section for beginners. And for trick riders, a double side kicker in a 60-foot flat box. Wakeboard Island. The best ride this side of the Rockies. Adjacent to the River's Edge Cantina at Blue Water Resort and Casino. On the Colorado River in Parker, Arizona. All right, I'd like to welcome my next guest to the line. Needs no introduction, a guy I've got a ton of respect for, uh, who is currently walking uh, to a rental car agency, Mr. Jason (laughs) Ellis. (laughs) Yay! Yeah, man. So, uh, yeah, you got to let him in on this because, uh, you know, we were talking before <laughs> you got on air. Uh, yeah, that's a hell of a story you got. Yeah, I might have accidentally crashed my car. I don't really want to get into what that one is, but then my girlfriend lent her car to a friend and it got written off. Everyone's okay, but it got written off. And then I took my girlfriend to a movie in my truck because that's all I got left. And the valet washed my truck. And for 25 bucks, they rearrange my seats so that the power seats don't move backwards and you can't get in the car. <laughs> oh. so, I'm walking to go get that bad boy right now. Yeah, you're putting in the cardio, right? That's, uh... <laughs> That's a lovely stroll down Sunset Boulevard. It's yeah, a great for time. sure. Uh, good thing it's not at night, man. You never know what will happen, right? Well, I look just as creepy as anybody else, so nobody fucks with me. Wait, <laughs> am I allowed to say that word? Sorry. No, it's all right, man. We uh, we we get so many guests in here. We uh, we bleep a lot of stuff before it hits uh, hits AM and FM. So no worries, man. <laughs> Good. No, <laughs> I just no, I can I can do it. I just need to know whether I can or I can't. I I got kids. I can switch off the F bomb. No, I'm, I'm you, let them flow, man. Let them flow. That's that's what we love about <laughs> the show. Just let them flow, dude. Uh, 
So, yeah, you know, I wanted to, you know, it's been a while. I wanted to get you on air and, and snag you and, uh, you know, just talk a little bit of everything, man. Uh, you know, it's uh, you always got so much stuff going on. And, uh, you know, I know Ellis Mania 10 just wrapped up. And, uh, you know, you've got yeah. got a new thing called Jump for Charity going on. But uh, I'd like to talk about Ellis Mania 10 for a second because – I got to tell you, you kind of got, I, I call it, uh, you know, the Jim Connor effect going on that, that Ken Block created where you start one yeah. and you always got to up yourself and you get to a point where it's like, what the hell do I do, man? I'm, I'm you know, what do we do next? Um, well, look, I remember a long time ago that in skateboarding, I figured there would be a certain level that we'd all get to and, and then we would just, it would never, it would, it would end, but... I remember when I was maybe 17, and I could I could imagine that when I was 27, someone did a blunt to fakie in front of me on vert. I would have said that's impossible, but apparently that's child's play. So anything can happen, and I believe after the last fight that I had, it just told me that, I mean, this is your gig, Jason. You started this shit, so you have to step up. So to me, I just train harder and... I hang out with real MMA fighters so that I can match them and maybe not die because I'm sure that in October, Alice Mania 11, I'm probably going to fight 20 people or somebody. It's, it's never going to win. I just, I just got to be in shape. I got to be prepared for it. I believe I've got like 10 more years of fighting in me and then maybe Alice Mania can, uh, I'll just watch. Yeah. Do you feel like uh, do you feel like the fighting is easier on your body than the skateboarding was? I mean, you've had so many surgeries; it's just ridiculous. I mean, you know, with the level of training yeah. you've got, I mean, you know, what, what's easier for you to recover from—a fight or a big spill? Well, you know, it depends on who you're fighting, man. I mean, every now and then, you get the better you get in skateboarding, the better you get. You know, you, it's kind of it's pretty it's pretty rare in skateboarding to get really knocked out to the point where you're not exactly you ever again. And in fighting, you catch that wrong guy. It's not everybody, but there's way more people in MMA that have caught a knee to the face when they're shooting in that, I mean, I know a lot of pro boxers are not that smart. Pro skateboarders are never that smart to begin with, so it's hard to judge, but I'm pretty sure the brain damage is the, is the fighting world and the skateboard world is the body damage. It's the ligaments and the, the arthritis and the... So I have both. I have brain damage and arthritis. I'm a super smart guy. Yeah. Most of the brain damage that came from skateboarding was, was shit after the fact. The guys were doing it at night, right? Uh, oh, no. I mean, getting knocked out like uh, 15 times on a skateboard, I'm pretty sure that had something to do with it, too. Yeah. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, you got so much going on. And a Jump for Charity just announced. I mean, uh, talk a little bit about that because I definitely want to give that a plug. You got uh, something pretty cool going on there. Well, I, I only started it today. I just noticed on vacation I my, I got really drunk and put a, my girlfriend's bikini on, and I got, the, like, the second most likes I've ever had on Instagram. So then I thought, why don't I wear that bikini and jump something because jumping is cool in Instagram and I just want to entertain people, and apparently they're very entertained by my me in a bikini. So why don't I put them together and make some money for a good charity, which is my dear friend Tony Hawk charity, because I know that it frees kids from what they were going to do on the streets, and they fall in love with the skateboard. Yeah. For sure, yeah. You, you, you kind of like me. You, you ever just uh, start brainstorming stuff up and and talk and go, "What the hell did I get myself into?" You know, it's one of those things. <laughs> Constantly, where it's, some of the best ideas the come thing, from that, though, right? You got to pull the trigger, man. To me, I go, you go do it, and I go, yes. I don't think about it. I just say yes, and then I deal with the consequences later. Because, I mean, I just don't. I just don't want to die without trying everything. So, if I'm really terrified, and usually I am. Almost every Ellis Mania, right before I get in there, I'm like, oh, my God, dude. What are you doing? And then everything's rosy at the end. You know, after skateboarding that life of being beat up that many times and waking up on the ground with my arms broken, it, it, MMA doesn't faze me. I don't you – know, the entertainment factor. You mean, I never thought I'd ever accomplish this much or mean this much to anybody. I, I owe them. You know what I mean? I – if I have to get brain damage and break my bones, I used to do it for fun, but now I'm doing it for people that really give a shit. So it's it's easier to me now. I'm, you know, I'm scared of my ex-wife, 
scared of police, but I ain't scared of pain. Yeah, you, you've experienced so much pain that it's it just kind of a, another day now, right? Yeah, well, it used to be another day. Now when you're older, it hurts more, and painkillers are nowhere, as near, nowhere near as much fun as they used to be. <laughs> yeah, they just make me angry. So <laughs> There's no highlight. There used to be like a, uh, when I was skate, I remember there were certain tricks. I was like, man, 50-50, you're either dead or you're rolling away. And then my plus side, if you don't roll away, you get Vicodin. Like, I really would say that to myself before I would jump in. So I'm like, it's a win-win. <laughs> now, there's no win in crashing. I'm 43. It fucking hurts. And I don't want to do any painkillers. And the ache, it doesn't heal. It takes longer. I'm looking at, like, MMA bruises, a little extra brain damage. But I really try to stay safe on my dirt bike, which is really the stupidest thing I've said so far in this interview. But... I try not to go through major catastrophic injuries anymore. Yeah. I know how that is on a dirt bike, though, man. You get on there and you're like, oh, I'm just going to go out for a cruise. It's fun to get on the bike and just go out and ride. And then uh, pretty soon you see something and oh, I got to hit that. And pretty soon you're like, man, I, I thought that I was going out here just for an easy day at the track or on the bike. And, you know, that shit hits a fan immediately, right? Yeah, yeah. At least one time every time I go, there's a little flash of my life. Every time I go ride, there's a little. I'm cruising, I'm cruising, a little slippery. And I'm like, woo, oh. But that's why you live. I mean, that's why I live, man. That, that rush, that was a close one, you know? That's, I live for that close one. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> so you feel like, uh, I got to ask you, you know, kind of about the radio thing and, and you know, and how you got started because we all kind of kind of know the background. I know me, it was one of those, I didn't have a background in radio. I just kind of got thrown into it and dropped in my lap and here we go, you know, four, four years later. But, you know, with you, I mean, do you, do you feel like radio in a sense, I mean, definitely added some years onto your life. I mean, uh, you know, how, how did everything come about with Tony and, and you know, and you getting involved with, uh, with, with radio and, uh, you know, and, and how things have taken off? That's all Tony. I mean, I thought when I retired, I knew that I was never going to be good at business or selling T-shirts. That was, but I, I mean, at that time, I wasn't sure if I was even, I figured I would just go back to Australia and dig holes for a living or, yeah, I really didn't see a lot, but I never expected anything too promising in my life. I escaped when I figured I already got my, what's coming to me. That was a very fortunate life to have. So Tony really, it was all Tony's idea. Me and him are friends, and he knew uh, of me to be a funny, quick-witted man. And he actually told me on his 20th radio show anniversary that he knew that I had the potential to be a great radio host and picked me for not just to be his, like, sidekick, but to be a radio host in the future without him, which is pretty crazy because I did not know that I, I didn't make my decision that I was going to be the best guy in radio until after the Tony Hawk show. I was just there making jokes. Apparently he knew it all along. Wow. And, you know, and I got to say, you know, just talking about radio and, and you, you know, on your show, you've interviewed just about everybody. But I find it, it kind of funny because the one guy that makes you nervous is every time you go on the Howard Stern show. And there's something about it that all of a sudden, you know, you just uh, it's like you kind of kind of get a little squirrely, huh? I think things have changed. I think there's a I think there was a time there where I looked up to him so much and and I was in his world and, and being on there it was like uh surreal you know and it was a different way i looked at radio then too it was like life or death to me you know like i i think it was still a, i still have a lot of mental things that i have to deal with but at that point i was really really insecure and for me to get approval from not like one of the people I looked up to the only person i looked up to in radio as far as i'm concerned i was like radio is full of assholes it's full of shit this guy's the only dude that actually talks normal yeah so I was, he was the only person I looked up to. There was nobody that could really tell me I was good that was, that was going to make me feel good. It was only him. And, and he doesn't like my show. <laughs> 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 but at this point, that's what I'm saying. Like the fans that I've earned, like they're like family to me. I don't, I literally don't care anymore. There needs to be so much more to prove. I was like, I need a TV show or a movie or I need to be an actor. I need to do stunts. I need to. My band needs to sell more. 
like albums like I was, it was not even a real band I was just like on this uh, momentum of trying to keep conquering things and, and prove to people that I'm worth it and I'm likable it's really quite a sad reason to try so hard yeah you're pretty much at peace with it now and, and just happy with the way things are then I wouldn't say exactly but I'd say fucking like uh, 90% closer than I was when I started that's for sure because I actually found out the other day that I didn't think he liked me at all, but he's actually going to have me back on the show, and I was like, whoa, crazy. But to me, going in now to Ben, you know, I thought if I did good that he would give my show a chance and that I would have a job. I, my, I had not, as far as I was concerned, defined myself as a radio host yet. I was still in the balance of just fading away into nowhere. I feel like, you know, I, I believe in my talent and, and, and my drive a lot more than I did, and I'm like, look, even if even if the king of all media doesn't like me, I'm going to be just fine. So, I'm actually kind of looking forward to those used to be really terrifying interviews. Like, like, like uh, more stressful than a skateboard contest when I was good at it. More stressful than the first race I ever had, which was really stressful because I didn't know what I was doing at all. Well, we'll definitely get to the talking about some racing here in a minute, but I got to ask you, I mean, you know, with the way action sports have, have grown and, and, you know, and, and you look at oh, just, you know, even, even on the, the auto racing side of things, but specifically, you know, like skateboarding, I mean, you know, I look at a guy like you and, and, and Dyrdek and, and do you feel like, you know, as you kind of, as you kind of, you know, grow to a certain point where you've, you know, you've hit that, uh, you know, that, that ceiling in skateboarding, do you feel like, you know, doing the media type of thing, I mean, and having an outlet, you know, is is kind of kind of what you have to do to continue to draw a check? Well, the, the media thing is, is not the important thing. It's the outlet is the important thing. I mean, when I, when I realized that I, I wasn't going to win, and not only was I not going to win, but I probably wasn't even going to make top five, and I kept getting hurt. I knew this was going to end, man. And I got into mixed martial arts. Tony made me a co-host. But at that time, me having my own show was hysterical. That wasn't going to happen. Yeah. I was just on his show getting 500 bucks every time I was on the show, which I thought was awesome. And uh, I was thinking, you know, what are you going to do? Are you going to get a some kind of interview and gig for ESPN. or so I really didn't know what I was going to do until sort of my father passed away and uh, my girlfriend got pregnant and uh, what else happened? I had my skateboard manager that didn't pay my taxes for five years and I didn't know because they did like everything in-house and I owed all this money and I had to sell my house and, and then my little brother died. So it was like a bunch of stuff that happened all in a short period of time, in about a, in about a year, really, where all that happened, where I was like, you know, I've had epiphanies in my life before where, I, I mean, I left the show to be a pro skateboarder and I wasn't coming back. And I got it because it wasn't some fucking pot dream. It was a real thing that I had, and a real experience. And at that point, there was a time there where I was looking at the sky and I'm like, I don't believe in God. I mean, Dad and my brother died so recently maybe maybe they maybe they could help me out here but it was a confusing time but i remember thinking if you get another shot dude because you pretty much fuck this one you get another shot come hard come hard like like you like never back off because in skateboarding i backed off i got bored i went partying i was more interested in getting laid and i paid for it i mean there's guys that are in the top three right now that i used to beat still and I'm, like, terrible now. So, to me, the radio, listening to Stern, Tony giving me that encouragement that I was funny and then serious, saying, dude, you have a real talent here. That kind of made me go, I can't believe you got a second chance at having a, what I call, no-job job. You know what I mean? Like, I got a skateboard job. Trust me, man. No money. I was still going to go to the fucking ramp. And same with the radio. I mean, once I found it, I was, like, addicted to it. I want to come home. I want to get back to work. When I walk the streets, everything is a story to me for the radio tomorrow. Like, it's an obsession. Yeah. Yeah. It's the only way it works. Yeah. Totally get that. Well, I got to ask you, you know, talking about, you know, skateboarding and, and coming to the United States, I mean, what was it, uh, you know, the first time you stepped foot on U.S. soil? I mean, was it was it just like, hey, I, I'm here and, and you know, and, and I've made it? 
Completely. It was actually, uh, when I think of all the other uh, things that have happened since then that are far special, more special and, and really ridiculously fortunate, getting off the plane and seeing the real America, the American air, the cars, people on the wrong side of the road, the haircuts. I have never been more excited to be anywhere in my life. It was, it was truly a, a historical, like, romance. <laughs> I fucking love this country, this country. Like, I love it. I'm never going home, ever. It's not even home anymore. i got to actually figure out how to say that. <laughs> this is home. Yeah. Well, I got to ask you, you know, before we uh, transfer into talking some, some, uh, some motorsports, uh, when was the last time you were on a skateboard? Uh, I skateboard with my son in the parking lot, like every couple of days. Okay. But I don't like skate. I got pads and stuff. I plan on going somewhere. I just don't really have any friends. And if I go to that Venice park, it's kind of like, man, it's not that much fun. I'm a vert ramp guy. If there was a vert ramp in LA, I'd ride like two days a week. I love doing Smith grinds and back to days. I'm just not a pool guy. I'm not a ledge guy. I don't want to, I don't want to go downstairs. I, I like vert ramps, and I live in the only city, unless you're sure why, uh, without a vert ramp. <laughs> oh, man. So that's it. Maybe, maybe when I make uh, Howard Stern money, then I'll have a ramp in my backyard. But until then, I'm just going to have to watch videos. Yeah. <laughs> For sure. Well, you know, talk about. My son thinks I'm great. He <laughs> thinks I'm still a very good skateboard. He has no idea. Yeah, well, I, I found it interesting. This is way back when you were on his show and you guys got in a fight over what was it, America's Got Talent, a bunch of skateboarders uh, on America's Got Talent. I was just laughing because I totally understand where you're, you know, me with my action sports upbringing and, and you know, and, and off-road and that type of thing. I just laugh because I'm like, he just didn't get it, you know? Yeah, because he's, he's well, you're going to try and make me say something that I'm going to regret, but <laughs> hey, everybody has their day. You know, yeah. you're 60, you don't know exactly what's going on in with the kids. Yeah, same as there's freaking twenty year olds that talk the way where I'm like, I don't fucking know. This is just the way of the world. Yeah. For sure. So, you know, talking about, uh, you know, you, you were talking about being in an off-road truck and, and stuff like that and, and being scared. I mean, uh, what was it, a couple years back? I know you did a super light with Lucas Oil uh, in the Lucas Oil series. Terrifying. Yeah. yeah. Like three, four years yeah, ago. Yeah, my MMA sponsor decided to pay a ridiculous amount for me to be a race car driver for an entire season. And I'm like one of those guys that rides motor. I have since I was a little kid, but I never raced professionally. I just rode dirt bikes and... Every time I went to a go-kart track, I usually won, as in a shitty, like, for a kid, go-kart track. So I figured I'd be all right. I always loved driving. And then I realized real quick that I don't know shit about driving a car in the dirt and how to not let it tip over and how to pitch it and pick lines and look up. And I'm like, oh, my God, did I get thrown into this. So, yeah, I, I got a lot of balls, but I had no talent at all. So I crashed a lot. I got, like, some concussions. It was, it was a scary year. It's kind of a sad year. I, I, as I said, I hate losing, man. Like, uh, somebody just asked me today, Rashad Evans said, were you uh, nervous about fighting those 10 people? And I'm like, nah. And he, I'm like, I'm nervous about fighting a real fighter where it's like I can possibly lose. I don't care about getting hurt. I just don't want to lose. And in that race, I was just in the back of the pack going, wait, what's going on? Why am I so bad? So it was terrible. But I learned a lot. But at the end, by the time I kind of figured it out, they were like, well, thanks for being here, but you are too expensive. You crashed too much. See you. <laughs> you finally hit your groove uh, and they took it away, right? Yeah, yeah. But look, I got I got a shot. I got once again, I got a shot of, of something that not many people get a shot of. I mean, I didn't pay for that car. Somebody else did. Hundreds of thousands of dollars are talking here for a, a radio skateboard asshole to go burn around the track all weekend. I, I ain't complaining. And in the end, I, I paid for uh, spring car school, and I hung out with, uh, I learned a lot there. But that car I is not the car that I was racing in, so I kind of learned a lot of habits for like a pro two that I never sat in. Yeah. Is that that pro light really didn't have any horses. Yeah, it was like more of a momentum thing. You can't really get that sideways. And I was just pitching it in corners and rolling around the corner. Someone told me. I didn't know. Yeah. 
You had more fun than anybody on the track, though, right? I disagree. I think winning is way more fun than rolling down the track. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, you know, and I know, uh, you know, that wasn't the end of it, though, because last year you uh, started doing some Terracross, right? Yeah, thanks to Justin Doors, I got myself a little Terracross deal, and then from that I turned into Polaris and IMG Motorsports. Motorsports got me my actual own razor, and and then all those guys at IMG and Four Wheel Magazine, they put in money to make that thing a real race car. And I've been learning, getting faster and faster. It's funny to realize now that this is where I should have been. Like, this is where you learn how, how to drive a car, not... Yeah, that step up. So I'm glad I'm down here with all these other people, and I'm I'm learning a little bit more every day. I went to track out the other day, so I actually got my my lap times up to like the fastest guy on the track last weekend. So he's like, I'm going as fast as I can. I can't pass him. So that means, in, in theory, in uh, in three weeks I will be his last. I did what I get eight. So this should mean that I should be in the front of the pack. So hopefully somebody crashes, I get on a podium. I actually feel like I could do it now. Yeah. Well, in know, this class. Well, and I know, uh, you know, th- you know that you're doing the Lucas thing, and then uh, Terracross this summer kicks off, and those are just some insane tracks. I know I, I was up in uh, Crested Butte a couple weeks ago, and they, they let me drive one in winter Terracross, and I ended up rolling it over, but uh, while leading the race. Can- it's not hard to do, my friend. It's not hard to do at all. Those tracks are pretty gnarly, but like you said, it's just so much fun. They yeah. just, I mean, you, I get off a plane and get in this car, and they're like, just for it, dude. I'm like, oh, my God, really? And there's just giant moto jumps. I love it. Yeah. Can... Didn't they, And i got to ask you, because I know they literally threw you into it. I think it was, uh, was it in Heydays or something like that in Minnesota? You, you were in two-wheel drive most of the race, right? Oh, no, no, no. Yeah, they got me. They, okay, I show up, and they're like, that's your car. And I just got in it and started it up and drove off out onto the track in two-wheel drive because somebody had it in two-wheel drive. And I didn't know. I don't know anything about it. My seatbelt didn't fit, and then nobody came over. So I was just like, well, I'll be okay. I'm just going out there to warm up anyway. And it's fishtailing everywhere. And on the tra- on that track, it was actually like a gap jump. You had to pin it around the corner and jump over the track, or you would land on people that were going under you. <laughs> So I jumped at first lap, and then second lap I was uh, two wheel. I rutted it, so I was on two wheels, and I was trying to balance the two wheels and stay on the gas. And once all four wheels hit the ground, sideways, sideways, and then I just launched over the gap sideways because I had to keep it pinned. I'm like, I'm not going in the hole. I'm going over the gap. So, yeah, that was my – everyone was like, hey, you're in two-wheel drive. And I'm like, well, fucking thanks for telling me. <laughs> But that's what happens when you spoil and you get thrown into stuff because you're uh, one of these lucky assholes. But I don't mind paying my rent. I crashed uh, the other day in uh, Glen Helen. Some dude side swiped me and I hit the guard K rail and flew off into the freaking track and rode the whole car off. It's, to me, I'm like, these are just reminders of me uh, to me of what it takes to be somebody. If you think you're going to get into motorsports and just get a free ride and start passing everybody, no, Jason. It's never been that way, it's, 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 and it's worth it. I'm going to suck. People want to laugh at me. I'm going to crash. I'm going to get knocked out. I'm going to get hurt. I'm going to get scared, and then I'm going to figure it out. I'm going to get mine. I'm going to beat somebody and get in the podium and make the greatest acceptance uh, speech you've ever heard in motorsports, ever, well, for I... third place. <laughs> <laughs> well, i got to tell third you. place in, in the UTV series. <laughs> I'm going to go off. I might cry. Well, I got to tell you, they told me I'm I'm racing the Terracross series this year with you, right? And uh, I'm looking right. forward. I'm looking forward to that acceptance speech, man. I, it's it's. I hope you get on the podium, buddy. The Terracross might be a different story. Those guys, that track is. I don't know. Maybe 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 it'll work out. But last time I was on that track, woo! I got a long way to go. Yeah, well, they, you know, I started talking with them this off season. They go, yeah, we got Levi Lavalley, we got Jeremy McGrath, we got R.J. Anderson, and I'm like, you know, I'm coming over from Trophy Trucks, but I'm like, my God, talk about a stacked field. I mean, that's throwing yourselves to the wolves. Yeah, no, there's some good dudes in there, but I, I think the last, the last thing I was in, I beat Jesse Johnson, so I, I don't suck that bad. No, that's that's legit to beat Jesse, man. He's got some roots. That's in my him. buddy. That's why that's the only reason I bring it up. I want I wanted to like hear this. Yeah. Fuck you, Jesse. I'm faster than you. I'll text him and tell him, hey, Jesse, this has got something for you, buddy. <laughs> Make sure. Make sure. Pop that on. Oh, I will. I definitely will. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, so uh, you, I, I got to ask you, too. I mean, you're talking about all this craziness. I know you and Ken Block are, are longtime friends. Have he ever taken you for a ride in the rally car? Because I've been up to his shop and everything else sat in him, but I haven't even had a ride with, with KV in the car yet. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I've been in there. Spinning around sideways. You ain't going that fast. If he took me on a rally, like in a real rally, that would be something I want to say. I just did the some fucking cheesy X Games calls. I'm like, yay, we're spinning around like assholes. Who cares? Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I know. It, you, know when you, when you know that real speed where I'm like, oh, my God, dude. That's what I want to see. Because I've seen video of him out in the, out in the dirt rally race, and I'm like, man, that's, a, that's an impressive thing to do. Yeah, threading the needle through the pine trees and, and everything else. I, yeah. I think that's, yeah. you know, that's, that's real driving right there. Yeah, no, that's edgy shit, no doubt. Yeah. For sure. So, what else do you got on tap for you? Uh, you know, coming up. I know. Uh, obviously, uh, you got uh, always got stuff going on, man. Yeah, well, I got Alice Mania eleven in October, October tenth. I haven't even announced it. I'm not sure yet, but I got that, and uh, I'm trying to do this mini Moto Mania at Star West, just a little starter kit one to see if I can get that to turn into like a Moto version of Alice Mania. And then what else do I do? That's it, man. I really am very fortunate lately. Serious take care of me these days. So I don't really want to do a bunch of TV. You know what I mean? I, I like to go to the gym in the morning. I like to do my job and then come home and hang out with my kids and my girlfriend. And every now and then I'll do the Dr. Drew show. But I really, you know I mean, I, 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 I'm very appreciative of my fans, my job, but, you know I mean, my family. I'm old enough now. I know what's important. So when I, when I can, which is, at this point, every night I get to see him. I don't, you know I mean, I, I don't get dragged around the country like a lot of other people do to make a buck. So I'm, I'm pretty lucky, man. And then just to top it off, I'm a half ass race car driver. I love it. <laughs> Fucking love it. <laughs> oh man. Well, I think that's a good, uh, good spot to let you go. I know you're uh, hoofing it to, uh, to a rental car agency and, uh, um, so I got a rental car. That's for my girlfriend. Now I got to pick up my truck. Oh, and gotta... then like in two weeks, I'll get my other car back. But yeah, great i love it i'm on the streets <laughs> well i know those boys from hoonigan got their shop down there and I, last time i was down there they got a bunch of cars stuffed in there and everything else you should have called scott and told yeah them, hey, man, i'm not going in there brother. to get my electric seats i mean i, I don't let me wait till i get a raise then i'll like go to hoonigan and get them to put some stuff on my truck right now i just want it to look <laughs> like it goes <laughs> All right. Well, I appreciate you taking the time, buddy. I know uh, you're awful busy, and, uh, you know, appreciate you coming uh, here on the radio show. And uh, we'll uh, Thanks for having me, man. Yeah, we'll definitely catch up with you, uh, you know, this summer racing some razors and, uh, you know, and, and hopefully talk to you soon. I'll see you in San Diego, right, Terracross. Absolutely kicking it off in uh, June. All right, man. Good All looking right. out. Take it easy. Thanks, Jason. Yeah, yeah thank you. Polaris rider Jim Beaver. I race trophy trucks professionally, host a down and dirty radio show, and also travel the country announcing motorsports events. I've seen it all, and trust me, I've done most of it, so when it comes time to relax on the weekend, nothing is better than taking time with my family in our Razor vehicles. They've got the reliability I need to just pick up and go explore the desert dunes or trail, and have the capability to attack even the harshest terrain. If you're looking for some of the most reliable and safest, and hands down most capable off-road machines in the world, look no further than Polaris Polaris and their award-winning lineup of Razor vehicles. Whether you want your daughter to experience off-road driving for the first time in a Razor 170 like me, take the entire family out in a Razor XP4 1000 on the weekend, or shred the desert and dunes in the all-new Razor XP 1000 Fox Edition, Polaris has you handled. Take my advice and join me and some of the best drivers in the world by driving a Polaris Razor. Check out the full Polaris Razor lineup at Polaris.com or follow them on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Polaris Razor. For 100 years, General Tire has provided tires for your lifestyle, your adventure, your anywhere. Born from competition, the Grabber Tire offers the durability and off-road traction you demand in a tire. We put these tires to the test in the harshest off-road racing conditions to give you a tire that will make your anywhere possible. So let us take you on your next big adventure. Tweet us photos at General Tire, hashtag anywhere is possible. Because with General Tire, anywhere is possible.
Baja, check. King of the Hammers, check. Crandon, check. The Mint 400, check. Only one wheel company can say they have dominated the deserts and rocks of the Southwest to the mud and carnage of the big house at Crandon, and that company is KMC Wheels. KMC Wheels has won them all with the help of elite drivers like Travis Pastrana, Ricky Johnson, Bryce Menzies, Carl Renazetter, and Lauren Healy, who all rely on the XD Series from KMC Wheels to get them to the finish line and on top of the podium. Check out KMC Wheels and their full line of XD Series wheels at kmcwheels.com or on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at KMC Wheels. KMC Wheels, like no other. Looking to have some fun on four wheels? Dirtfish Rally School has you covered. Packing as much adrenaline and adventure as you can handle into high-performance all-wheel drive and rear-wheel drive Subaru rally cars is where the fun begins at Dirtfish. Just 30 minutes outside of Seattle and Snoqualmie, you'll get a chance to train up to three full days with some of the country's best instructors and be put through the high-octane rush of rally on mud, dirt, and tarmac. Get started today and call 425-888-7715 or visit us online at dirtfish.com and use code 911 for a 15% discount. Looking to upgrade the brake system on your race car pre-runner or weekend toy? JMAR Performance Brake Systems has you covered. An industry leader in performance braking systems, JMAR can outfit your vehicle with the highest quality American-made calipers, rotors, master cylinders, hubs, turning brakes, and shifters for Volkswagens to trophy trucks and everything in between. For more information and their full product line, visit JMAR on the web at jmarperformance.com or follow them on Instagram and Twitter at JMAR Brakes. But right now, Amy Hood hanging out. Uh, how's everything going, Amy? Hey, how's it going? Where's my intro? I was so ready for that. Oh crap! Hold on, I I totally spaced it. I was doing this Gibson. Uh, I was doing this Gibson thing. So hold, hang tight. We gotta uh, let's uh, stop, reverse. All right, here is uh, Amy Hood. How's that? Yeah, that was good. All right. All right. I, I totally botched that. I was talking to, about Gibson exhaust, and uh, you called in, and I picked you up. And, uh, yeah, that's uh, – yeah, I, I got to tell you, I've had that song stuck in my head all weekend since I did that. So, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm hating you right now. Uh, I know. It's pretty funny. Um, I mean, I got – no one really knows how to say my last name. Everybody jacks it up because it's spelled kind of ridiculously. It's spelled the French way, H-O-U-D-E. So everyone calls me like Amy Howd or, I don't know, Amy Hoodie or Howdy. Oh, my gosh, it drives me crazy. And, like, you know, especially Americans will come up and be like, oh, Amy Howd. It's like, no, it's Hood. Amy Hood. <laughs> and no one even believes me that it's Amy Hood. So I made sure in my new video that's dropping this week that I – instilled in your brains people how you say my name and you'll never get it wrong again i promise <laughs> yeah, well you showed me some of the clips from the video and i w i literally was rolling with laughter hilarious <laughs> i know and it sucks because i've had to kind of keep pushing the like delivery date and when i'm going to drop the video just because i mean every video i do i want to make the next one bigger and better um, and this one, I haven't been able to film a lot of riding shots. Like, it's not easy to film yourself riding, people. I can't exactly hold a GoPro as I have jumps. It just doesn't work. So uh, I've been trying to line up a couple more times to get out and get actual riding footage so that we can evenly pair the goofiness with Moto. So yeah. um, hang tight, it's coming up. <laughs> um, but yeah, I know we have a special guest today on our show. Yeah, as you say that, uh, we got Taylor Robert uh, calling in right now. How's it been going, Taylor? You're on air with Jim Beaver and Amy Hood. Hey, how's it going? Hey. Yeah, things uh, things are good, buddy. Uh, you know, I, I think uh, things are even better for you, though. Right now, uh, you know, this is the big one this week. I mean, uh, X Games. You uh, you yourself, uh, back in 2013, X Games gold medalist. So, uh, you know, it's, it's got to be a pretty exciting week for you. Yeah, definitely. I, um, I'm i really excited. This will actually be my first race this season because I broke my wrist in December and I broke the navicular, which is the one that doesn't heal. So, of course, I had to wait like three months. And then, uh, yeah, finally just been getting back on the bike. And I'm actually pretty excited that X Games will be my first race back. Yeah, I mean. Yeah, that's pretty sweet. Yeah. What a way to, to come back, right, uh, you know, with X Games? Mm-hmm. <laughs> 
Yeah. Yep. And I mean, obviously, it's like the biggest action sports event in the world. So uh, it's always cool that they, um, well, at least the last four years, they've had Enduro Cross in there, which is huge for off road racing. Yeah, well, you know, and I know this year, uh, you know, to talk about 2015, because uh, you were slated. I know you've done, uh, you know, the Enduro Cross Series here in the States a while. I mean, we'll, we'll talk about that. We'll talk about, uh, you know, you're a works champ. Um, but you were slated to go uh, race in Europe, right? What do they call it? Super Enduro over in over in Europe? Yeah, exactly, which is basically just the European version of our Enduro Cross Series. It's uh a somewhat similar format. They do a little bit different over there, but the tracks are real similar. <clears throat> and um, I actually, I did do the first, I did the first round and then I broke my wrist like three days after the first round when I was practicing at my house. Um, but I didn't realize I broke it and I went to a couple <laughs> different doctors and they, they told me I didn't break it. So I kept racing. I went and did two more rounds in Europe and then I finally had a doctor that found out it was broken and I got surgery on it. So yeah, unfortunately I didn't get, AFL. I wasn't able to do that whole series this this winter, but uh, come the end of the year, which it usually starts a couple of weeks after our series ends, I'll uh, get to give it another go at the Super Enduro Series. Yeah. That's cool. Is the level of racing over there kind of like motocross? You know, um, they often say that the European motocross is on a whole different level. It's just the tracks are more intense, the riding's more intense, longer motos. Is it kind of similar to Enduro Cross, the European series? <laughs> Um, yeah, it is. I mean, it, it is and it isn't like it's it, when you, once you get over there, it feels completely different because I feel like there's like a broader range of riders over there as far as there's in the United States, we have a lot of good and cross riders, but there's really, you know, three or four guys that can win at any time. And over there, there's like seven guys that could win. And, uh, so that makes it a little bit more intense and you do shorter motos on a lot narrower tracks, which makes the riding just insane because over here, our main event is 15 laps, which usually is about 12 minutes. And over there okay. you do um, seven minutes plus a lap and you do three motos and you just guys, oh, okay. you have guys bashing each other. And then the second moto they do are like a reverse start, kind of like an arena cross where the guy, top oh, guys yeah. start in the back. So it just, oh. it makes for some pretty chaotic racing over there. But okay. uh, all, in, all in all, like it's, still similar but it's just um kind of different because of the format and how many good guys there are over there yeah and i mean the track but, must be super different because you're jumping country to country not like here you're just kind of going across the states but i mean you're going from a completely different train from one country to the other like that must be pretty cool yeah and the biggest difference over there is that they have somebody different build the track every weekend which makes it like pretty inconsistent where here we have safer tracks and they build every single enduro cross track and they build the, even the X games ones. Mm -hmm. So uh, like, at least we kind of know that he knows exactly what he's doing and he has this program set for every round, even though the tracks are always different, you know, it's like super cross. They have the same guy build every track, but over there, yeah. somebody different builds every round because they have a different track builder in every country. So you're like, Hmm, I don't know what we're going to get this weekend. <laughs> it's like Russian roulette, right? Uh, yeah. That's awesome. A little scary. Yeah, though. the first yeah, the first round was a little scary over there because they went to a, a they went to Poland, which they hadn't been there in a while, and uh, they went to an arena they'd never been to, and they didn't bring in enough dirt, so the track was like super thin. We were down to the concrete in like four or five places, and uh, and then they, the because they didn't have enough dirt, they made the track real narrow. Where here our tracks are, you know, at minimum, I think they're. 20 or 22 feet wide and over there it felt like the track was about 12 feet wide so it was a little sketchy that first round yeah well how has the transition been for you because uh, you know obviously you know your works rider you know what i mean you you, you you're you used to uh you know some outdoor riding um you know your backgrounds in that it's not like you're coming over from supercross or motocross or something like that but how has the transition been to enduro cross i mean being uh you know a top level enduro cross racer i mean it's been a, been a pretty hard transition for you as a rider uh, kind of. I mean, I, I actually did grow up doing motocross and I only raced motocross until I was 15. And then I started racing the work series. And it was just kind of because my, my dad and his buddy had started racing the works races. So I just kind of started doing that. And then after a year of racing works, I already had like a factory team green ride as an amateur. And I was like, wow, I get way more support doing this. I guess I'm pretty good at it. So I just kind of started doing that. And then, um, when I signed on with factory Kawasaki as a pro, uh, 
they had me do enduro cross, and the first year was definitely rough, just because enduro cross is so intense, and it just yeah. basically takes all off-road elements and puts them into a 45-second track, and uh, so it was kind of hard for me to adapt to that intensity and just um, like your heart rate goes from resting to 190 like in a half a lap, so 30 seconds, mm-hmm. and uh, it was pretty crazy. But after the first year, I started getting the hang of it, and then. Um, yeah, I mean, I feel like I picked it up somewhat quick because my the first year I ever raced it was 2011, and then by 2013 I was able to win a gold medal. So it was definitely a, a rougher transition than just going from motocross to off road, though. Yeah. Yeah. Are there certain elements from the two series that you like about one and you know don't like about the other, in, opposed to works and enduro cross? Like, are there certain things you like about each one? Yeah, I mean, enduro cross is nice because it's kind of like supercross in the fact that you you know you go there you show up you don't really you're not there all day we only have to ride you know part of the day and it's nice because it's a show but in the worst side of it you know it's it's also cool in the opposite aspect that you go there it's more of like a family environment you get to hang out you're there all weekends and you know it's kind of like a a motocross or amateur national in that aspect that yeah everybody gets along and it's not like everybody's just trying to go out there and <laughs> take each other out but yeah i don't know i like all i really like all forms of racing i mean i've been getting into more of like the extreme enduros i did erzberg last year but unfortunately i won't get to do it this year because it's actually this weekend which is the same as xcn yeah. so um yeah i've just been trying to get out there and do everything i was actually supposed to be the first two outdoor nationals this year too but my broken wrist kind of <laughs> hindered that yeah well, totally do a little bit of everything i mean that's how you become an all-around um, you know, good experienced riders doing a little bit of everything. I yet have the opportunity to do a works race, um, but we have a pretty cool and, you know, um, bush riding series here. It's the Manitoba Dirt Riders, and they've been bugging me to come out there, but I'm just not really good at racing three hours at a time and through, like, rocks <laughs> and trees and bushes, but I'd like to try it one time, but, uh, yeah, I know, I got to get yeah. to go kind of test my endurance, but uh, if you can do that, I think you can do anything, <laughs> to be honest. Yeah, definitely. And that's kind of always been my goal since I started racing off-road when I was 15. I was like, you know what? I just want to be good at everything because I found out that I hate sucking at stuff. So I was like, you know what? I'm just going to try and be, you know, the best all-around rider I can be. Well, and, and that's what keeps riding fun, you know, when, you, when you're when you out there and, uh, you know, you look at the same thing, you know, day after day after day and, and it gets to, you know, kind of be monotony. But, uh, you know, if you can go ride motocross one day and then, you know, go do a little bit of enduro cross or, you know, or, or some desert riding, you know, it, it mixes it up. And I think that's what keeps it fun and keeps you energized for, for riding. Yeah, exactly. And I got to bring you up here one time to try some ice racing. I don't know if you've ever tried it before. But I mean, you can still smoking to expand your horizons and race in negative 30 degrees. Um, yeah. Try out and come try it out. <laughs> it's basically I know, like, like flat track. It's awesome. I know. I've seen that and I've wanted to try it out. I'm not huge, like, on the cold weather being out from Arizona. <laughs> no, yeah. But I, uh, I would like to. My brother actually works for uh, Dirt Rider, and they went up and did an ice race in Wisconsin this winter. And he said it was pretty cool. And just the traction that you get on those bikes is amazing when you think of riding on ice. Yeah. yeah. No, it's pure hookup. I mean, there are even forms like ruts in the ice and stuff. It's, people don't even realize how similar it is to, you know, kind of moto in terms of, you know, just pure hookup and throttle control. And um, you can just give her right out of the corners. So you don't slide at all with those, uh, you know, that's on your tires. <laughs> but it's cold. Yeah. I mean, it's really cold. If you don't like snowmobiling and you're a little bit of, uh, you know, cold weather tribe, it's definitely not for you <laughs> <laughs> no i want to try it and um i just you know it's not a huge uh, sport down here in the southwest so i'll just have to <laughs> figure out how to make a yeah. trip up that way and try it out yeah you and i are arizona boys it's like i just tell amy she lives at the north pole you know it's uh, yeah. <laughs> uh <laughs> but uh you know talking about being an arizona boy i know uh you have the opportunity uh last uh into last year i had destry abbott on air and, and we talked about uh you know kind of his career and, and his training facility but i know you spent a lot of time with destry there at uh at his uh facility i mean how's that been uh you know progressing your career because i mean destry i mean you look at, uh, you know, I, I just call him one of the legends of, uh, you know, of, of, you know, motor motorcycles, period. You know, he's done a little bit of everything, but it's got, it had to been great for you to be able to train there. Yeah, it really has. And um, I've known Destry and looked up to Destry for a long time. It was actually 
kind of funny how it all came together because when I was seven years old, I was racing motocross and uh, Steve Hatch, who's another off-road legend, moved in like a quarter mile down the street from me. So Steve and Destry would always train together when I was growing up and I was like, man, I just want to you know, be like those guys. And then I uh, ended up just kind of following in Destry's footsteps, I guess. And he's kind of been uh, a mentor of mine since I started really racing off-road, which was, you know, about 10 years ago now. And uh, and then he got this training facility going, and it's just awesome because we've got a great group of guys in there. Um, there's five five of us in there alone are going to X Games this week. So they uh, yeah. definitely got their pro- program together. And, um and yeah, we they actually he just started you know to up it another level for us and created a program just for like us top athletes that you know want to be the best we can be and like he got a trainer specific for what we want to do and it's really come together pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah, and I mean, it wasn't at his training facility there that he threw threw in that X Games ramp that I know is going to be at Enduro Cross this time. Was that at his training yeah. facility built built one? Gee, that's uh, crazy. What do you yeah. think of that? Yeah. Yep, it's uh, it's definitely uh, been pretty cool. So it's you know it's cool just you know being connected with Destry because he has so many resources and so much knowledge that you can just you know kind of learn and and uh, grow from just being around him. Yeah. Well, I saw your uh, I saw your sick no footer you pulled off uh, off the ramp, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, which was funny because we were all you know we hit the ramp and you know, I'm. I've hit ramps before, but it's been a long time. So we went out there and we all hit the ramps. And I was like, I wonder how I can make it even more technical. And I did that. And it was more scary dropping off the ramp than actually jumping the ramp. <laughs> well, that's what I was looking at that, you know, oh, yeah. just off the ramp to flat. I mean, that's, uh, you know, that's kind of nutty. It's kind of like step up. I mean, it's just kind of an acid drop, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Talk- but, uh, no, it's all, all good fun. And that's the cool thing about off-road racing is that you can basically do anything you want and it'll benefit you as far as you know i can ride my child's motorcycle or, or ride mountain bikes or anything and you can always relate it to off-road racing because it's just such a wide variety of riding yeah well yeah. I, I saw you do some stuff with specialized too right on uh, on the bicycle side yeah um just recently in the last couple months um kind of got together with a specialized guy and got a couple mountain bikes and just been shredding those things up so that's been pretty fun it kind of gave me something to do for a little bit before i was able to get back on my dirt bike uh for my broken wrist so yeah, how, been going good. how has that been for you i mean you being able to go back and forth because i know uh, amy and i are friends with ronnie renner and i know i know renner he he bounces back and forth quite a bit i mean is, is it uh is it you know is it pretty good for you off you know off the dirt bike training to to do uh you know the mountain bike stuff yeah, I think so. I mean, because it's a good cross between, you know, cross training and having fun because, yeah. Uh, yeah. you know, when I was younger, I was riding road bikes and a lot of the pro motor guys still ride road bikes, but I just get so bored with riding on the road. I just want to shoot myself. So, mountain bike, you, <laughs> you know, you at least get the uh, the endurance and then you still have a lot more fun than just riding on the road. So that's what I like about mountain biking and uh and then you can go up to the ski resorts and and do downhill which is I think as close as you can get to riding a dirt bike on a bicycle yeah yeah my other side of the family actually like one side we're all motocrossers and the other side live in BC and are downhill mountain bikers so it's pretty cool because my other girl cousin she's one of the top Canadian downhill mountain bikers and She's been trying to get me out to the mountains and stuff, but that is way too gnarly for me. I do not want to go down a mountain without an engine and no control and hit a jump. Like, no, just I don't think so. Uh, but the tree, I don't know. Yeah. But I think the course would be great training for um, enduro car off and the work riding because it's, you know, kind of similar train. But, yeah, just uh, a little sketchy for me. <laughs> yeah, it is pretty fun, though. You should try it because they have a lot of just, like, I mean, they do have uh, most of this stuff, especially in Whistler, they have some pretty awesome jumps, but they have just fun, like, single track stuff that um, I think is a blast, too, because you can just, they have, like, full-on wall burns and stuff built, so. Yeah, looks awesome. Go there and, yeah, definitely and the moto place down. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. So talking about this week, uh, you know, what's on tap for you, uh, Taylor? I mean, uh, obviously X Games. I mean, what's what's the plans? I know you're you're still in uh, in Phoenix right now, right? Uh, give us uh, kind of the rundown of what your week looks like. 
Um, yeah, this week is kind of like a taper off week as far as our, our training program goes. We went really hard the last couple weeks, and then this week you taper off so that, you know, when you come into the race, you're hungry and, and your body's not worn out. So this week, just you know, uh, today we're actually doing a, a yoga class at the gym, and then we're going to spin for a little while. And then uh, tomorrow and Wednesday, just going to do some short sprints on my indoor cross track at my house. And then I'll fly out to Austin on Thursday and and hopefully that'll be the golden ticket on Friday. Yeah. So uh, do, here's a question. Do you guys have, uh, you know, uh, at a lot of these venues, do you have an idea of what the track is is going to gonna look like beforehand so you can kind of set your training up and cater towards that track? Or is it is it, uh, you know, kind of a shot in the dark when you show up, you get to see it for the first time? <laughs> um, a little bit of both. They, they usually give us a track map for all the courses at the beginning of the year. So we kind of have an, oh. an idea. But I would say eight times out of ten you show up and they might have all the obstacles that are going to be on the course on that track, but they're always, like, in a different order. Or they don't look anything like what they did on the track map. So the track map just kind of gives you, like, a general idea of what they're probably going to have there. Like, if they have a firewood pit on the track map, chances are they're going to have a firewood pit there, but it could be twice as long or it could be in a turn or something weird like that. So... They always uh, try and change it up and throw some curveballs at us. But, uh, yeah, we have a, a general idea. I know this weekend they uh, – or this week they've been having a real tough time at the track because they got so much rain in Texas. So they uh, – they oh, yeah, been that's mixed. right. Yeah, they – Schaefer, the guy that builds the track, he actually posted a picture of all the plywood that go or a video of all the plywood that goes underneath the dirt just floating away because they got so much flooding there. Wow. But, um, That's yeah, I know, crazy. yeah, but I know the, the last couple of days they started moving some dirt around and, uh, they've been having to mix in a bunch of lime with it to try and draw out the dirt, which is actually what they had to do when we did the global X games in 2013, because it rained at every single event. So, uh, I think they got a system down and hopefully they'll, they'll have it all set up for us when we get there on Thursday and race on Friday. Yeah. Well, let's, uh, it's gotta gotta be exciting for you, knowing uh, might be a little uh, little wet weather because obviously uh, you, you've done pretty good with it in the past, taking home a gold, right? Yeah, well, it's just kind of crazy. Um, you know, I've thought about this before. And I don't really ride in the mud that much. I ride in a lot of I ride in a lot of real slippery stuff because it's dry slick in Arizona. But you know, we don't get a lot of rain or mud. But the only two indoor cross races that I've won have been like the slimiest, nastiest ones, which are. The one we had in Germany, which was a mudder. And then last year, um, I won my first AMA race in uh, Washington, which wasn't really a mudder, but it, the dirt there is super soft as it is just because it sits outside in Washington all year. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, so it's funny how the the ones that are muddier somehow favor me. I'm not sure how that works. <laughs> <laughs> I love mud races. It's my favorite. <laughs> yeah. They're fun, you know. If you just that I went to was been a mud race because I knew I would have done ten times better. Ugh. Yeah, I think it, it's really just how you go into it mentally. Like if you go in there, you're like, oh, you know what? I'm just gonna have some fun. I'm not gonna be all mad because it's muddy. And exactly. usually it works out pretty totally. fun because as long as you, as long as you get in a little groove, the mud actually makes it pretty fun. Yeah. Yeah, and I always know that everyone else there is like freaking out, They're like, oh mud, and I'm like, yeah, like now. It's and now it's about survival of the fittest. Like, who can just stay up, you know? So, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Like yeah. Well, you know, I know, uh, you know, here, here's a question for you, you know, kind of on your, uh, on your program. I know, uh, was it last year you, uh, you made the switch and you said, uh, you know, team green kind of got involved with you in the beginning, but uh, you made the switch to, to KTM, um, you know, and I think, you know, for what you're doing now, uh, obviously, you know, with, with the Enduro cross, I mean, KTM on the off-road side is just legendary. I mean, how, how has that switch been for you and, you know, to, uh, to, I guess from green to orange? Uh, you know, it's been awesome. Cowie, Cowie was really good to me for the three years that I rode for them as a pro. And, and you know, they're they're a legend, too. Industry's ridden for them for 15 years now, I think. Um, but this, the switch to KTM for me really kind of, I think, is going to help me progress my career and everything that I want to do because they just have such a worldwide presence. And um, kind of like I was saying before, I want to be a really good all-around rider. And with KTM, I can basically – go anywhere in the world and they'll have yeah. a bike there for for no what I, no matter what kind of racing i'm doing whether it's Erfberg, if i want to do a world enduro or a 
you know, a GP, whatever I want to do, they they have so many resources all around the world, and their their main passion is off road riding, which is really cool as an off road rider. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Awesome. Well, I know uh, yeah. you're you're uh, you know awful busy uh, with X Games week. You got anything for him, Amy? Before we let him go. Well, I did want to ask, basically, for all of our female listeners out there. Um, did a little bit of social media creeping, and I saw that you had proposed to your lady on a street bike ride, which I think is awesome. I hope that if yep. gonna, it's something like dirt bike related. Um, but I got to ask, <laughs> think you're going to incorporate anything like a dirt bike related into the wedding? You know, a motocross boot centerpiece or a KTM on top of the cake. I did see a video the other day of the full wedding party in head-to-toe gear, and they rolled in all the chap- to the chapel and... On dirt bikes. Uh, you got to go that far, or do you have, like, anything at all? <laughs> um, you know, they, she's, like, super chill, and she really doesn't have a, a big opinion either way. But And she actually rides motorcycles herself. Oh, really? <laughs> but, uh, yeah, and she she's always just ridden off-road and kind of trail ridden with her dad. She's in her race. But she's a really good rider. Um, but anyway, uh, I don't know exactly what we're going to do there. We're actually having the wedding about six miles from my house and uh i did have the thought of maybe just myself and all my buddies and maybe even her we could just um um we could maybe just ride our bikes down to the wedding venue and then just you know hang out there but uh i'm not sure exactly what we're going to do yet but it was it definitely was fun proposing to her on the bike because she was not expecting it and i kind of wanted to incorporate that into it because motorcycles are such a huge part of both of our lives so oh, we'll have to see what I'm we can do. Right that's so cool <laughs> <laughs> yeah we'll have to uh, see what we can do and come up with something original for the wedding awesome yeah i think uh that's, that's uh that's great um you know congrats uh you know on uh, on the engagement uh you know and uh you know good luck this weekend at x teams man uh here's hoping uh, you yeah. can walk away with uh with another gold yeah, definitely the plan. I mean, we, there's a lot of good guys riding this weekend, so just going to go out there and do the best I can do. I mean, hopefully the have usually fun. the X Games tracks are yeah, have fun and usually X Games tracks are cool because they're a lot bigger than our regular stadium races. So just go out there and take advantage of the big track and have a good time. Yeah. Well, and one question before we let you go, I know I keep adding these in here, but uh, but our our <laughs> no. partners our partners at Rigid Industries, uh, partners of mine, uh, you know, with, with a radio show and my trophy truck program. Uh, from what I understand, you got a pretty sick ride. Uh, yeah, they. Uh, I actually just bought a new truck in uh, December, and then I got a hold of Brett over at Rigid, and he's been super cool, just kind of helping me deck it out and get it basically ready to be uh, kind of like a chase truck in, in case KTM decides to go back down to Baja. And uh, and yeah, just I built. I bought a brand new GMC Canyon and put a bunch of rigid lights on it and got some king shocks for it and uh yeah it should be pretty trick once it's done i'm still kind of in the process of finishing it right now but i'm uh, i'm pretty excited with the way it's turning out nice good deal well um you have a, a great week good luck at x games and uh you know we'll talk to you soon you got anything for him amy no that's all man you're super fun to talk to come back on and tell us about your victory at x games next week <laughs> <laughs> All right, cool. Thanks, guys. It's been a blast, and uh, hope to talk to you guys soon. All right, sounds good. Thanks, Taylor. All right, thank you guys. See you. All right. Got to give a big shout-out to Players Razor, General Tire, Rigid Industries, Dirtfish Rally School, UPR.com, Bloater Resort and Casino, J. Moore Performance Brakes, KMC Wheels, Parker Motor Company, Gibson Exhaust, MTX Audio, the official audio partner of the Down and Dirty Radio Show, and Intense Tees. Uh, and don't forget to uh, give us a follow at Jim Beaver 15 on Instagram and Twitter, Facebook.com slash Down and Dirty Show or Down and Dirty Show.com for all the back episodes. Uh, don't forget to get our app available on Apple, iTunes, Google Play, and the Amazon Kindle Store. And uh, follow Amy Hood on social media as well. And uh, also me on Periscope at Jim Beaver 15. And uh, we're going to cap things off here with uh, Amy Hood's intro music since I botched it the first time around. We'll see you next Monday.